And what is up, everybody? It's the top of the, well, not really the top of the hour anymore, here on 90.3 WMSC Upper Montclair, 4 p.m. Eastern Time. And you know what time it is, right? Yeah, you know what time it is, I think, I hope. It's time for the Digital Dash, everybody. I am your host, Javier Reyes, and for the next three hours, I'm going to be talking to you about all the stories, the impressions, the unabashed opinions, the little idiosyncrasies out there in the world of pop culture goodness, and sometimes featuring only, and I mean only, the most illustrious of guests. Today, it's the beginning of the semester, first show of the semester. Sorry if I haven't seemed as energetic as I usually am. I also forgot to say it's time to kick the tires and light the fires, Big Daddy. I forgot to say that. My bad. But, nevertheless, it is the beginning of the summer. Wow, semester. <laughs> it is the beginning of the semester, and uh, I'm back. New time. It's new time, same dash, you know, and today we've got we've got a pretty cool show coming up. Uh, firstly, we've got my friend Alex Vitas. He's going to call in, and we're going to talk about the Super Bowl because uh, it's Super Bowl week. Um, if you didn't know that, then now you do know. And he's a Patriots fan, and we're somehow really close friends uh, in spite of that fact. Uh, maybe not for longer, especially if the Pats win on Sunday, but uh, we're just going to talk about it. And I want to, like, you know, dig into his braid a little bit, just figure out how you could possibly root for this team that is just um, – it really taints the heart of America, the Patriots. That's really what they do. They make us all feel bad, you know. And nobody really feels good about it, you know. And and I don't. I know people make the excuse about you know, oh well, a lot of teams when they do well, people just don't like them. No, the Patriots are different. The Spurs won a lot, and we didn't really hate them. You know what I mean? Unless you're like a Rockets fan or a Mavericks fan. But anyway, that's Super Bowl. Then going to talk about Spyro Reignited Trilogy. It's a PS4 game. It's not old, but it came out back in November, uh, but I recently got around to playing it. I just felt like talking about it because um, it's the type of game that I feel like we don't see much of anymore um, for sometimes good reason, um, and I just want to give my thoughts on it. Um, and then lastly, unfortunately, I was playing to have the pure one, Robert O'Connor, for those who have longtime listeners of the show who know what I'm talking about, but he couldn't make it in today, so it looks like I'm going solo. I have to go. I have to do it. You know what I mean? I know that we don't have the our number one ace. I don't have my ace in the hole with me, Mr. Rob, but I have to talk about the Oscars. I've been waiting all week, ladies and gentlemen, all week to talk about it. And it's been killing me. It really has. And I, I'm really excited for it um, because the Oscars are whack, for those who didn't know. Um, but before all of that, of course, we're going to go through the movie and TV news and gaming news roundup um, in the form of the opening dash. Uh, right after a quick little break. And yeah, guys, it's the Digital Dash. I'm excited. It's going to be a good good semester. It's, it's early, and I feel off a little bit right now. It just feels weird to be doing this at 10 o'clock in the morning. That's not like an ungodly hour to be doing this, but it's, it's earlier. So I feel a little bit off, but we'll see what happens. All right, guys, um, stay tuned. It's the Digital Dash, 90.3 WMSC Upper Montclair. And what is up, everybody? We're back here on 90.3 WMSC Upper Montclair. It's time for the opening dash. Let's get started with a very a very special announcement. Now, there is a lot of things that happened in the few weeks that I've been off, um, but I decided to collect, of course, just the most important stories that I felt uh, got me the most excited anyway. And one of those, ladies and gentlemen, was it's just, it's just a beautiful announcement that was made. It's, it's beautiful because, you know, I feel like I didn't, I didn't see this coming so quickly. You know, because I feel like we were wondering if there would even be another sequel. But we got that answer last week. Reading from Collider, Christopher McGuire signs on to write and direct two back-to-back Mission Impossible films. Mission accepted. Christopher McGuire is coming back for two more Mission Impossible films. Variety reports that the Rogue Nation and Fallout filmmaker has signed on to write and direct the next two Mission films. McGuire confirmed the news on Twitter. But that's not all. Per the report, the studio is planning to ride the popularity of the franchise and shoot the next two films back-to-back with Mission Impossible 7 set for summer of 2021 and Mission Impossible 8 to follow on 2022. The dates were set to avoid conflict with Paramount and Cruise's upcoming Top Gun Maverick, which McQuarrie's also had a hand in. So, everybody, uh, Mission Impossible I talked about before on the show. It was one of my favorite movies of last year. It's one of my favorite franchises ever. Tom Cruise is amazing. I love all of his movies. Not all of them, but he's, he's, just, he's just a national treasure when it comes to movies specifically. 
And this was awesome because I think that this is probably them saying this is it. And I like that they're doing some Avengers type nonsense where they're going to have a back to back like one year after another. Kind of like the ultimate finale. That's what this sounds like. It sounds like they're going to make this the, the 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 capstone. You know what I mean? Like this is we because the last movie like it didn't end in a way that we thought it should have a sequel, but it ended in a way where it wouldn't be bad if like they didn't. You know what I mean? If they didn't decide to, you know, follow it up with anything. And in this case, not only are they following it up, they're following it up with two back to back. I can't wait. I know it's a, it's like feels like a long time from now, you know, two years I got to wait, but I'm more than willing because these movies are just the pinnacle of action right now. Um, they Fallout had some of the best action sequences I've honestly seen in like ever, honestly, personally, just as long as I've been alive on this planet that we call Earth. Um, and I think that it really is one of the other things that got snubbed by award season just because it's an action movie and i think that it's one of the better action movies made in a really long time so i'm happy to see that they're doing more and christopher McQuarrie is signed on to direct them he did like they said fallout and ghost protocol and i'm really excited or not fallout and ghost protocol he did fallout and um uh, rogue nation so i'm excited guy i don't know i i know i'm harping on this a lot but i can't wait it's gonna be fantastic um and, uh, 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 Whatever. Uh, moving on to a, a little bit of a strange kind of story that I thought was was kind of funny from reading from Deadline. Uh, Screen Gems wins deal to turn Ubisoft video game Just Dance into a movie. Exclusive from Deadline. In competitive bidding, Screen Gems has acquired motion picture rights to Just Dance, the wildly popular Ubisoft game. Screen Gems will develop a film based on a franchise that is the best-selling music video game of all time, with 121 million players worldwide in all age ranges. Multiple studios competed for the rights deal. So I just thought this was weird. I don't know if they've ever heard of Step Up because that just sounds like what they might go for if they do a Just Dance movie. But I thought it was goofy, so I put it in here. Um, the Just Dance game, seriously, though, make boatloads of money. And I think people don't realize it in the gaming community all the time because the type of people who play Just Dance aren't the type of people who are necessarily looking up all the new gaming news like me. So they're, they're not as vocal about being like Just Dance fans, but those games make boatloads of money like every year. So it's not necessarily surprising that Hollywood be would be looking to try and cash in on that property in some sort of way. Although I have no idea if it really will work the same way. I just feel like we have other dance movies. Like the the, the dance off or step up was like a franchise and I feel like that's what they're gonna do with this. But just plaster on the, the just dance name. I don't know. Uh but moving on. Uh the Uncharted movie, speaking of more uh video game related uh, movie stories. Ten Cloverfield. This is reading from Variety. Ten Cloverfield Lane director boards Uncharted movie. Dan Trackenberg, who broke out with Ten Cloverfield Lane, will direct Sony Pictures' adaptation of the hit video game Uncharted. Trackenberg, Trackenberg. I hope I'm saying that right. Replaces Sean Lev- Levy, who had to depart the project due to scheduling conflicts. Sony has been hoping to work with Trackenberg since twenty since Ten Cloverfield Lane uh, opened in 2016. Uncharted is based on the PlayStation video game series that follows the adventures of tre- treasure hunter Nathan Drake. The film stars Tom Holland and chronicles Drake's first encounter with the professional rogue Sullivan. Sony has been trying to get the film off the ground for quite a while, originally going with veteran actors like Mark Wahlberg. After the success of Spider-Man Homecoming, the studio began scouring the development state slate to find Holland's next project and decide a younger Drake character would work out well. Um, this is one of those movies that I'm just rooting for. I don't know if it's going to be good. Um, I don't know if it makes sense necessarily that they're going with a younger Nathan Drake, but I do like Tom Holland. I think that uh, Marvel kind of stumbled on him. I think that they were looking for a good Spider-Man, but I think they might have actually just discovered someone who in like 10, 15 years, I wouldn't be surprised if this kid's like not a kid anymore, but would be like just one of the five biggest movie stars we have. I think he's supremely talented. Um, And I think that he has shown it a little bit in the Spider-Man movies um including infinity war um that he's just really really good um and i know he's been in a couple other small things but i think that he might be just one of the best better actors in a few years that we have um and I'm, i think that he's just going to be a star um he clearly he already is a star but i think that he's going to be even bigger um and i'm looking forward to uncharted because uncharted is a great game it's a great video game series if you haven't played it i do recommend playing it if you like good things i recommend playing it um but uh, I'm I'm rooting for this just because I've been rooting for a video game movie to, to be good, like, since forever. And I really, I, I 
totally dismiss and resent the idea that they can't translate to the big screen. I think that's ridiculous. I think that every story can translate. Maybe it's harder for certain ones to translate because books, there's not like for book stories, it's not, um, there's not a definable image animation that you see it's in your head you know what i mean you're reading it um so it's a little bit it's not as hard to coo- to like complain about it and say you can complain but there's there's ways to get around that i think easier than say video games and anime and tv series turned into movies or whatever um but i do think that anything can translate i really do i think people have to look up the old thor and captain america movies i'm not talking about thor with chris hemsworth old I'm talking like the first one from like 2000, like 10 or whatever. I'm not talking that old. I'm talking like the 70s or whatever. Those things look terrible. And if you told someone back then that they would be, without a doubt, the most guaranteed box office successes would be superhero comic book adaptations, uh, especially if you told someone from back then, they wouldn't believe you. And they'd say there's no way these things can translate. So, yeah, that's my little uh, spiel on Uncharted. Uh, moving on to the next thing. Uh, John Wick Chapter 3's trailer came out. Uh, John Wick is incredible. I don't really need to say much more. It showcased uh, Halle Berry, who's going to be in this one. Um, I'm not going to spoil the last one if anybody didn't see it. Uh, but John Wick's got a lot of people after him. Let's just say that. He's got a lot of people after him now. And the trailer looks good. I don't think it was this incredible, mind-blowing trailer. But I do think it looked quite good. And I'm really excited because the first John Wick, um, the first two John Wick movies, I think, are phenomenal action films. And I think that they've really kind of made Keanu Reeves like a lovable character again in a lot of ways um, because of those roles. And they're just unexpected. We didn't expect the first John Wick to be good. Or at least we didn't expect it to be just as good as it was. I really do think that movie's phenomenal. Um, but yeah, the trailer looks cool. The movie's still set to launch May 17th of this year. So looking forward to that. Um, and still speaking of trailers... I know you guys are probably wondering when I was going to bring it up, or at least you might have been. I don't know. Maybe you don't care. Maybe you're not even listening right now, and you do care. I don't know what I'm saying. Uh, Spider-Man Far From Home's trailer came out uh, last week. Uh, I remember on Twitter, I said that everybody, it was now, to, that day was now a national holiday, and everyone should take off work. Um, nobody listened to me, of course, but I'm really excited. It looks good. Um, it's got Mysterio, who's played by Jake Gyllenhaal in it. He's the villain now. Uh, it looks cool, man. It looks cool. Uh, I think it was a good trailer. I think that there's just this wide curiosity amongst everyone where everyone's kind of like, you know, spoiler alert, uh, Spider-Man died in Infinity War. So a lot of people are wondering, like, they just kind of are casually just glossing over that. Now, I don't think it should surprise anybody that he's coming back. This character is worth too much to that universe and for you to kill him off so quickly when you just got the rights back to him for the MCU, uh, I think would be just, just strictly speaking just a bad business move um and in this case i think that it's it's just a little bit it's just it's just so odd to me like the time we're living in where like this character died the last time he saw him and we're just gonna pretend that didn't happen and now he's going on a uh uh to study abroad or go on a two-week vacation with his friends in europe or whatever and it looks really fun um there's obviously some some more cool stuff that they're gonna do with that character and i'm interested very much in the Nick Fury dynamic that he's going to be in this, another character who, spoiler alert, died at the end of Infinity War. Um, and just to see what that chemistry between him and Tom Holland and Spider-Man are going to be like, which reminds me of the Ultimate Spider-Man comics a lot. So I'm really looking forward to that. Um, and also, of course, uh, Jake Gyllenhaal's Mysterio, who in the comics is a villain, but in this it looks like he's a good guy. It's their own interpretation of it. That tells me that he's going to be a good guy at least for a good amount of the movie. I could see... Or even for the entire movie. I could see him becoming a villain at some point, though. I don't think that Mysterio is just, they're just going to make him a good guy. Like, you can't, just not going to happen. Um, but I'm really curious to see it because Jake Gyllenhaal, one of the bigger A listers we have, and the, him making his kind of comic book debut um, in this movie um, has me curious. Maybe he thinks, hey, I'm looking, f- I thought this role was good. Um, who, and the other report is that he actually auditioned to be Spider Man back in the day, which is interesting. Um, but yeah, really excited for that. Not going to harp on it too much because I think you guys are getting a little tired of me talking about Spider-Man, quite frankly. Um, but whatever. Moving on. Uh, the price of Netflix. I don't know if you guys knew this. Uh, you probably did if you check your bank account and stuff. Uh, the, price looks, the price of Netflix went up last week. Um, reading from USA Today. Your Netflix suspicion is about to get pricier. 
The popular streaming service announced that it will raise prices across its U.S. plans for new subscribers on Tuesday and for existing users over the next three months. Netflix's most popular plan, previously $10.99 a month for two HD streams, uh, will rise to $12.99. The cheapest $7.99 non-HD plan will now be $8.99, while the premium option that allowed four simultaneous streams in 4K will rise to $15.99 per month from $13.99. Uh, let me see. Netflix is raising rates to fund its push into original programming. It was reported by The Economist last year that the company was spending between $12 billion and $13 billion on original programming in 2018, releasing popular films such as Bird Box and Roma, as well as the new seasons of TV shows like 13 Reasons Why, Orange is the New Black, and Netflix's Daredevil. So this is interesting. Now, what's, what's so cool about Netflix is it's a fascinating kind of – they're, they're a largely being compared to Amazon in the sense that Amazon for years kind of wasn't really making money. And they just invested in a, a bunch of things until eventually they are what they are now. And Netflix is kind of the same way where they're just pumping out a lot of money into original content, but they're not necessarily making a lot of money right now. They're, they're actually factually not. Uh, not. And what's interesting is because of that, people are wondering, you know, are they going to be in trouble because, you know, next year they have the Disney Plus service that they're going to have to compete with. But I think it's the opposite, actually, because... The bottom line is when people, investors, I think, look at Netflix, they just see one number, and that's like the 200, 300 million or whatever their subscriber count is. And that's a lot. So what they're hoping is that they put out as much good quality original content, you know, like the the, the titles that I mentioned before, even though 13 Reasons Why is, why is categorically like just not good. <laughs> it's just not a good message from everything that everybody's told me about it. Um, but like Orange is the New Black and... Netflix, the the Marvel shows, and things like Stranger Things, which will be coming back in July, and they just they ha they have a ton, you know what I mean, and and that's what they're trying to go for is they're trying to make as much original content as possible. That way, they can do this price hike, where eventually they get to a point where they really start making um, a lot of money off of this this uh, service, or a lot more money, I should say. Um, so really curious to see how that plans out, especially when Disney comes out with its own service um, to compete. That's going to be quite uh, the streaming wars are real. And everyone talks about the console wars, but the streaming wars are, they're, 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 they're something. Um, but the next story, we got a lot of stories today, guys. Uh, the Ghostbusters sequel. This was announced last week. Um, reading now from The Verge. A sequel to the original Ghostbusters is being planned for 2020. The Ghostbuster franchise is coming back. Entertainment Weekly reports that Sony Pictures has tapped Jason Reitman, the son of Ivan Reitman, who directed the original 1984 film, to direct a sequel set in the world of the original Ghostbusters. It's planned for a summer 2020 release. Um, and also another fact that is not mentioned right now. Oh, yeah, here we go. It appears that Reitman's sequel will completely ignore Paul Feig's 2016 reboot of the franchise, which recasts the main characters as women, starring Kate McKinnon, Leslie Jones, Christine Wiig, and Melissa McCarthy. While generally well received by critics, the film was the focus of intense criticism from fans and internet uh, trolls. In particular, Jones was targeted by a racist harassment campaign on Twitter. While Sony had high hopes for the film as the first installment of a potential franchise, the film's lackluster performance effectively killed off those plans, and Fee later said he would be, quote, very surprised if a sequel materialized. So here's the thing. First of all, that Ghostbusters movie is, in my opinion, not good. Uh, I saw it, the 2016 one with um, all those people. I do think the cast is good. I think they're all very talented, um, especially Melissa McCarthy, who I think is awesome. And, you know, she's been nominated for an Oscar this year. I think that it was just not funny. I thought that they had really cool people in it, but there's just a lot of dead air in that movie. And it just felt like it wasn't, I don't want to say real Ghostbusters, because that kind of implies that this is such a giant franchise. It kind of is. It's Ghostbusters is kind of big, but Let's like relax. It had like an animated series, a couple video games, and two movies. <laughs> like, like let's relax. This isn't Star Wars. Um, you can change it up just a little bit. It's like when people freaked out when Jumanji was going to like a video game sort of take on it with Jumanji: Welcome to the Jungle. I'm like, why are we acting like that first Jumanji movie is like the Ark of the Covenant? It's not. It's it's good. It's cool, and it's a unique type of movie that a lot of people remember. But it's not this, you know, beloved franchise. You know what I mean? And with that movie, I didn't like it. I thought it was, I would actually just say it was bad. But I did think, without a doubt, it got way too much hate and criticism. Um, at one point, I think it was one of the most disliked YouTube videos ever, which says a lot about our culture, everybody, whether you choose to accept that or not. The fact that this movie was the focus of so much, uh, you know, disgust and anger from a lot of people. 
it kind of shows that there's still a lot of misogyny and sexism that still exists, especially when it comes to entertainment. Do I think that it was necessarily a good idea to do that movie? Not necessarily. Do I think it deserved as much hate as it got? Not even close. You know what I mean? How about you give Bohemian Rhapsody more crap? You know what I mean? You should give that movie, um, um, uh, what was I saying? You know, do I think that that movie was necessary? No, I don't think Ghostbusters, the 2016 one, was necessary. Do I think that it deserved as much heat as it got? Not even close. You know what I mean? Go watch. How about you people out there that were hating on Ghostbusters, you know, thumbs down the, the Bohemian Rhapsody trailer, which was directed, I know he left halfway through the project, by Brian Singer, who's a pretty much a terrible human being. You know what I mean? A waste of space, I would say, actually. Um, so maybe we should stop, like... It just shows you that there's still a lot of problems we have when it comes to entertainment. But uh, I guess I'm excited for this. I don't really care about Ghostbusters. I thought it was a good movie, the first one, but I'm not, like, wild about it. But I do think it's interesting how people are kind of like, eh, about this announcement. They're excited, but they're not thrilled. Most people, anyway. And that's kind of crazy, and it shows you what happened with that 2016 reboot where everybody's just soured on this franchise, in quotes, where, like, the son of the guy who directed the movie you all love, you Ghostbuster fans out there, and you're not, like, losing your minds over it so i just think that says a lot about everything um but moving on before i get really upset about things uh disney reading from variety uh hunchback of notre dame a live action reboot is in the works at disney disney is early is in early developments on a live action the hunchback of notre dame movie based on disney's animated film and victor hugo's 1831 novel notre dame de paris playwright david henry huang is attached to write the script with Men Deville Films and Josh Gad set to produce. Alan Menken and Steven Schwartz will pen the music. Uh, cool. Uh, I don't. I'm, I don't, I actually remember watching the Hunchback of Notre Dame, the anime movie, like when I was really young, and I honestly just have images of it, and I have no idea what that movie is like. That story is about really. I know it's about a hunchback. Yeah, before everybody jokes about that, but that's all I remember, and it's kind of interesting that that's all I remember. <laughs> um. But still, um, I guess this is an announcement that was worthy to put in my list here. So I talked about it. Moving on. Chris Evans and Tom Holland are set to star, reading from Ner- the Nerdist, are going to star in Netflix's serial killer drama The Devil All the Time. Say what you will about its release model, but Netflix is taking a lot of big swings in the world of movie making. Last week, they released a trailer of Dan... Let me me keep moving on. All right, here we go. They announced another upcoming project on Wednesday, Antonio Campos' The Devil All the Time, based on the novel by Donald Ray Pollock, with a truly insane all-star cast. Chris Evans, Tom Holland, Robert Pattinson, Mia Wazilowska, I don't know how to say her name, Um, uh, Bill Skarsgård, Elisa Scanlon, will star in the adaptation about, in quotes, a serial killer couple, a faith-testing preacher, and a corrupt local sheriff in a story told across two decades. Only reason I really wanted to throw this out there is because Tom Holland, big fan, obviously, with Spider-Man, and Chris Evans, who I've talked about on the show a lot, and I think that his post-Captain America, post-Marvel career is the most interesting of all the Hollywood Chris's. That's just me, and he's my favorite Chris. Um, so I'm excited for that. Big, big cast, you know what I mean? Robert Pattinson, another one. One of the more underrated actors we have, I think he unfortunately still has the stench of the Twilight movies on him. Um, And I'm not saying, like, if you like those movies, you know, good for you. I'm just saying that a lot of people don't and that they kind of just pin him in that corner. Uh, If if anybody hasn't seen it, I recommend seeing Good Time, which came out at the end of 2017. Really, really good movie. Um, Its politics are a little bit weird with some of the messages it has to say, but it is a really, really good movie, and he is excellent in it. And honestly, he could have been an Oscar nomination last year. But whatever, moving on. Uh, this one's pretty funny. Um, I was really happy to see this just because it was weird. I'll get I'll get into some of the things I don't like about all this though. Uh, from Variety, Space Force, a comedy series from Steve Carell and Greg Daniels, has been set at Netflix. Reading from Variety, like I said, President Donald Trump's proposed Space Force may debut on Netflix before it actually makes it to space. Variety has learned that the streaming giant has ordered a comedy series from The Office alum Steve Carell and Greg Daniels titled Space Force. It is described as a workplace comedy centered around the people tasked with creating a sixth branch of the armed services. Uh, so this is really cool. Big get for Netflix, I think. Um, and will kind of make everybody stop. All these Office fans. Like, I have, a, I have a conspiracy theory. Did people just discover The Office in the last year or so? It's like The Office and Friends are the only shows people have ever seen. If you go on Twitter, those are the only shows people have ever seen. Now, I approve of the love for The Office. 
I've watched the first season and everybody that I trust says it really is really like an exceptionally funny show. Um, and I've watched the first season like at the end of last year. Um, and I have to get to watching the rest of it. I haven't seen The Office before. But with Friends, I'm like, Friends is fine. I've seen a decent amount of Friends. It's fine. It's an okay show. It's not like the end of the world. Like, wow, let's make sure we talk about this every single day and never, you know, Lord forbid, watch anything different. And it just feels like on Twitter, this is all I see, man. Facebook, too. And Instagram, too. Every social media. It's just Office and Friends. Mostly The Office. And I'm like, have people ever seen any other show? What's going on here? <laughs> like, It's just The Office. And I feel like it's happened in the past year. This is my hottest take yet. I feel like in the last year, this upsurge in talking about The Office happened. Despite it ending five or so years ago, I believe. It's not like it just ended. It's not like there was any new announcement for it, particularly. I don't know. It's just, it's just odd. It's like people rediscovered this show. I don't know. It's like if people just randomly were like, oh, you know what was good? You know what was really good? Indiana Jones. And just everybody started making memes and stuff about the Indiana Jones movies for years. Like It's like, what's, I don't know what's going on. But uh, looking forward to that big get for Netflix and curious to see how it turns out. Uh, just a few more stories. Um, Monopoly. That's right, the board game. Uh, reading from Deadline. <clears throat> um, Kevin Hart is to star in Monopoly movie for Lionsgate and Hasbro. Tim Story to direct. Lionsgate and Hasbro's live action feature Monopoly is passing go with Kevin Hart to set to star and the actor's ride along collaborator, Tim Story, due to direct. The hot package, inspired by the iconic board game, is in final negotiations. Um, yeah. <laughs> this is like the, the WTF kind of announcement of the week that came out that I saw. Uh, I was just really taken aback by it because it was random. Um, Kevin Hart, definitely not in the, the good graces of people lately. But, you know, I people like are dismissing this with good reason. But also, I wouldn't sleep on it. It might be just crazy enough to work. I don't really know why it's I, I just I fear for how bad this could turn out when it comes to just what monopoly means. Kind of. I don't I don't want to get into the cultural, like potentially racist things that could happen if this is done in the right way. But um, I'm kind of looking forward to it. Now, I'm not saying that I approve of what Kevin Hart's been accused of lately. I actually am. I talked about this last week with on Alejandro's show where I was like, that was, you know, he, he, his lack of an apology and being, and the whole Ellen fiasco was just bad, a bad look. But I am personally, I think Kevin Hart's pretty good. I think he's good at his job. I think he's funny um, at what he does. I think his little mannerisms that he does are really funny. And I still have Jumanji stuck in my head. And I think Jumanji, what, Welcome to the Jungle, I mean with The Rock, I still have that movie stuck in my head because of how good it was, frankly, and just because nobody thought it was should have been as good as it was. And that's why I just feel like you shouldn't sleep. I just feel like Jumanji reminded me, you can never sleep on any movie being good. You know what I mean? We can assume a lot of times that movies aren't going to be good, but you just never know. And every like couple years we get something like the John Wicks of the world or Jumanji that just breaks through makes a lot of money or is critically acclaimed or whatnot and i just we have to remember like especially when we haven't seen anything just just wait a little bit before um judging too much that being said i don't think this movie will be good (laughs) that with all that being said i don't think the movie's gonna be very good um next to last story uh, a resident evil tv series is in development at netflix uh reading from deadline resident evil is headed to television uh, I have learned, and the person saying I is Nilly Andriva, a writer for um, Deadline, uh, that Netflix is developing a scripted series based on the hit action horror franchise. I hear the series will be a Netflix global original. German production and distribution company Constantine Film, which is behind the Resident Evil movies, loosely based on the Capcom video game series, is the studio. Search is underway for a showrunner to shepherd the adaptation. So again, rooting for it. Uh, any video game thing, I hope, adaptation, I hope, succeeds. And this is just the latest to go through it. It's interesting that this announcement happened last week when Resident Evil 2, the remake, came out. Um, which I hope to bring my friend Jack Harmony on later. Uh, maybe in the semester to talk about it. And I heard that it's excellent, by the way. And then for them to announce that they're remaking this thing, really cool. Uh, the Resident Evil movies make a lot of money, but they are not good. They are very, very bad. They're the only successful like video game movies ever. And they're just not good. And my my dad loves them. My dad's so weird. I hope he's listening right now. Dad, you're so weird. You like literally everything. I wish I had his taste his taste palette too for movies. Cause I've seen this guy like every single movie that we've seen. He liked The Last Airbender. He liked 
uh, he likes all the Resident Evil movies. Everything he comes out of seeing, he likes. One thing I will say, though, is he knows when a movie is very, very good. He'll say something's good, but every once in a while he'll say, like, that was excellent. You know what I mean? And he doesn't say that all the time. You know what I mean? So don't go to my dad if you want to know what movies are bad. Go to my dad if you want to know maybe what is truly, truly good. You know what I mean? There's a, there's a difference there. There's a little gray area that makes sense. Um, but, yeah, uh, so that's that. And then lastly, a tiny little teaser announced type of announcement. Next Christopher Nolan film is to open in July 2020. This from The Hollywood Reporter. Um, Christopher Nolan's next movie is slowly coming into focus. Warner Brothers announced Friday that Nolan's next film will open in IMAX on July 17th, 2020. The project is described as an event film, but nothing else is known about Nolan's latest venture. The writer-director has a propensity for secrecy, pending his script his scripts away from any prying eyes. Furthermore, he is of such a stature that he can attract the actors he wants, package his project with this with thespians and then present it to a studio with what amounts to a simple yes or no question are you in or out it's true um his last movie dunkirk uh grossed 526.9 million globally and earned the filmmaker his first best director nomination uh wow um cool i like that we just know a release date nolan is one of the better filmmakers we have in my opinion and certainly one of the biggest filmmakers we have and anything he really does is, is kind of a big deal so Looking forward to that um, and seeing what happens. Uh, but now we're just going to k- take a little bit of a break. I'm going to drink some water because I'm really tired of talking into a microphone by myself for like 40 straight minutes. Uh, and then we get, when we get back, we're going to go through the gaming news really quickly and then some of my reads of the week. So stay tuned, guys. You're listening to 90.3 WMSC, Upper Montclair. And what is up, everybody? We're back here on 90.3 WMSC, Upper Montclair. Whew, a lot of movie news I just went through. Wow. That was fun, though. I enjoyed it. I hope you guys enjoyed it, too. Uh, moving on to just a few gaming stories. Uh, really long opening dash today. If you couldn't tell, I'm kind of like uh, stalling, basically, because I didn't have as many topics as I wanted to today, especially since Rob was supposed to come in. And now I'm, you know, just trying to make sure that I stall for time just a little bit, if you know what I mean, if you catch my drift. Uh, um, but anyway, um, the first story um, is just kind of a... Just just an overview of the best-selling games of 2018. All right, that list was like made official um, last week, and this is from the NPD numbers, which is a group that kind of tracks all these things in entertainment. The best-selling games of 2018 in order of highest to lowest, Red Dead Redemption 2, Call of Duty Black Ops 4, NBA 2K19, Madden NFL 2K19, Super Smash Bros. Ultimate, or Madden NFL 19, I'm sorry, not 2K. There's a big difference. Uh, Super Smash Bros. Ultimate, Marvel Spider-Man, Far Cry 5, God of War, Monster Hunter World, and Assassin's Creed Odyssey. Now, what should be noted, what I think we can take away from these numbers is, one, Call of Duty is still big, and anybody who thinks that Call of Duty isn't big is a moron and doesn't know what they're talking about because people really love those games. And also, just to whisper, uh, they're still pretty good. They're good games. They What they do well is... I just think that more than any other shooter on the market, first-person shooter on the market, that just the simple mechanics of the aiming and the movement, just that simple gameplay that they have, the aiming down the sights, I think there's a reason why people keep coming back. And I think that they've mastered just that simple thing, the aiming down the sights and shooting. Maybe you could say that it's an on-rail shooter and that there's not much depth to it, but I do think that it plays better than most other shooters. It just feels right when you're playing Call of Duty sometimes. And you kind of can't help... Just going back for one more respawn if you're in multiplayer and just keep going and keep trying at least one more time. You know what I mean? There's just something magical about how they're able to, since what, like 2006, they've made a Call of Duty game every year? It's really insane. It's become Madden at this point. It's absolutely absurd. It really is. It's an unbelievable thing to think about. Um, also, that Red Dead 2 was huge. Shocker. Rockstar makes big games and good games. Uh you know, sports games are in there, as always, NBA 2K19 and Madden um, 19. Uh, you know, NBA, I always like seeing that at the top because at least the NBA 2K series, I love how they really do strive to make a different game and push the boundaries every single year, despite the fact that they really have no competition. And on the other side of that, Madden, which is, you know, kind of a perfect summation of football and why it is a great sport, but it is also the worst league. Their games, do they rarely put any effort into them? There's still been problems with them. And trust me, guys, I've played them a good amount. Um, year after year, they just have the same kind of faults. Meanwhile, the 2K series adds new things, despite having no competition. I just EA is just the worst. 
which we'll get to more into with another story on the list. Uh, they are just the worst. Don't root for them. Um, Super Smash Brothers Ultimate. It was big. Uh, you know, Super Smash Brothers actually, when you look back at some of its numbers, not always a system seller. Not always. Um, it wasn't a system seller necessarily for the GameCube. Not necessarily always a system seller, especially not for the Wii U. It did not sell any Wii U consoles. But when people like the console that it's on, it sells really well. Meaning when people like the Wii, when people like the Wii, so Super Smash Bros. Brawl, and for the Nintendo Switch with Super Smash Bros. Ultimate, the game sells quite well. Um, and I've played it a lot. I talked about it last week, with, or not last week, but a few weeks ago with Jack. It's awesome, and there's just something beautiful, beautiful about playing a game where you can play as Pac-Man and him smiling and throwing fruit at people as he fights against Ryu from Street Fighter. There is just something really beautiful and incredible about that. Seeing Mario punch Cloud from Final Fantasy in the face, or Samus fighting against Yoshi and and the villager from Animal Crossing, it really is one of the great miracle franchises out there where it's just a constant sense of, I can't believe this exists, permeates throughout that entire franchise. Especially with, I'm sure that there's going to be even more crazy character announcements for that in the future. With the DLC for Smash Brothers Ultimate. Um, and then the second takeaway that I have from this is two things. Two games. Marvel Spider-Man and God of War. Those are two games that are exclusives. Two exclusive titles that were on the top ten. That's kind of rare. You know what I mean? Especially when Marvel Spider-Man was a project that... I, I don't, I don't want to say that that one's as remarkable just because it's Spider-Man. It's one of the biggest properties in the world. But it's, it's definitely remarkable with God of War, which basically sold a lot because... A lot of word of mouth and just how good it was. And God of War is a relatively big franchise, but it's definitely past its prime. You know what I mean? And for them to come back and basically reinvent God of War and make it, you know, I haven't finished the game, but it's excellent from what I've played of it so far. Uh, Multiple scores of tens. It won the game of the year from the game awards. It's an excellent game. And it's really cool to see. It's like, wow, like Sony has two exclusives that somehow were, because these other games are for every other console. You know what I mean? Red Dead is a, as a multi-platform deal, Black Ops. Um, and Smash Brothers 2 is the other one that, but Smash Brothers, I think we kind of could have expected. Um, but the NBA series, you know, Assassin's Creed, um, Far Cry 5, um, Monster Hunter World, which is, people might not realize how big that game is. I think it does uh, better in some other territories outside the U.S. especially. It's a really hardcore series. Um, and I think that's one of the takeaways, is that Sony's are doing really well right now. And as much as I think they've been making some mistakes, especially last year where their E3 conference wasn't very good, um, where they just made silly decisions like blocking cross-platform play on Fortnite, the biggest game in the world right now, uh, I just thought they made some really weird, um, silly, stupid decisions last year. Bottom line is they still have a lot of properties and studios, and they've still got Last of Us Part Two coming out. They'll have a sequel to Horizon. They just have all these studios that are making good properties and sequels to properties. And I think that's the bottom line is they just they have so much in the bank, even when there's nothing coming out immediately. They just have so many exclusive titles that people like. They have too many IP. That's why they're winning and doing so well right now. But yeah, um, and another thing I just mentioned, Fortnite, reading from The Verge, Fortnite made an estimated $2.4 billion last year. In 2018, Fortnite became a full-fledged pop culture phenomenon, one that was one that has turned out to be incredibly lucrative. According to analyst film Super Data, Fortnite was the top-grossing free-to-play game in the world last year, raking in an estimated $2.4 billion over 12 months. While much of Fortnite's revenue comes from selling character skins and emotes, Super Data says that 34% of all U.S. players also purchased a seasonal, in quotes, battle pass, a feature that has since made its way to other online games like PUBG and Rocket League. For comparison, according to Super Data's findings, Fortnite made significantly more than established free-to-play games like Tencent's Honor of Kings, known as Arena of Valor in the West, which made $1.3 billion, League of Legends, $1.4 billion, Pokemon Go, $1.1 billion, and Candy Crush Saga, $1 billion, which also more than doubling the amount earned by the top-grossing premium game, PUBG, which is similar to Fortnite, uh, raking in $1.035 billion. Um, so yeah, Fortnite's really big. I said top se- selling best games of the year. That was not counting free to play because if it was counting free to play, then it would basically every year always be stuff like Candy Crush, League of Legends, and <laughs> Pokemon Go. Which some people have said that the Pokemon Go wave died. It didn't, guys. It still makes a lot of money. It's just that people don't talk about it in like the pop culture, you know, mainstream consciousness type of way as much as they do for Fortnite. Um, and Fortnite is huge. The end. That's all that I have to really say about that. 
Um, and now I mentioned before about how much I hate um, EA. And here's why. This is a story from Kotaku. EA has canceled its open world Star Wars game. Uh, Electronics has canceled its open star open world Star Wars game, according to three people familiar with going ons at the company. The game, announced alongside the shutdown of Visceral Games back in 2017, had been in development at EA, EA's office in Vancouver. EA Vancouver, a large studio that mostly handles support for a variety of the publisher's games, including FIFA and Battlefront, had been working on this open world Star Wars game uh, s- since October 2017 when EA closed Visceral Games. Until then, Visceral, best known for its popular Dead Space horror series, was developing its own Star Wars game. That project, codenamed Ragtag, was a linear action adventure game directed by Uncharted director Amy Hennig. EA Vancouver had been assisting on the project, and then EA closed Visceral Games on October 17, 2017. So yeah, here's the thing, guys. They hadn't shown this game publicly. Now I'm talking about the open world game. But let's just recap what... uh, in the, I'd, I think it's about five or six years that EA has had the Star Wars license. Let me let me list for you the games that they've put out for the Star Wars franchise. Star Wars Battlefront, Star Wars Battlefront 2, and... Oh, wait. Oh, wait, that's it. Just two Battlefront games. EA is just one of the worst publishers imaginable, and they are terrible. I, I am so upset that they have this, this uh, license, and the fact that they can't do anything with it really speaks volumes to how trash they are um (laughs) cav if you're listening right now uh yeah i asked him instead of you all right you're mr oh oh, oh, i'm too busy i want i want to go to italy now and oh oh, i'm too busy and i i can't meet my deadline so i don't want to hear it i texted this in our group chat at like 10 o'clock last night what did you think i was gonna ask him to go get ice cream tomorrow come on come on cav i hope you're listening i really hope you're listening right now yeah, maybe you could come out too if you want anyways. But anyway. Um, so yeah, EA is just a bad company. The fact that, for people who don't understand, Amy Hennig, she did the Uncharted series. And the fact that they can't get, like, they, they keep canceling these games. Who doesn't want to see the person who was behind Uncharted do a Star Wars game? You know what I mean? An open world Star Wars game too? Like, they, they I, it's just unbelievable to me that they keep canceling these projects. Like, they just don't know what they're doing. You know what I mean? Unfortunately, I don't think Disney might even care all that much uh, because the movies, as long as they keep making money and this doesn't impact them on that front, they probably don't care. Um, it's it's really unfortunate, guys. I could rant about this all day, but I want to you know get through the rest of the stories. So we'll move on. Um, on a happier note, uh, SNES games. This is from Polygon. Nintendo Switch Online data mine hints at SNES games coming to the Switch. Uh Nintendo Switch Online members may have more than just classic NES games to look forward to as part of their collection. One Nintendo fan looked at the source files for the NES game collection and says that they found code for a variety of Super NES games, including Super Mario Kart, uh, The Legend of Zelda, A Link to the Past, and Super Mario World Within. Uh, Cappuccino Heck, a modern in the Nintendo community, tweeted this weekend that they dug into NES Online files this weekend and posted a long list of references to SNES games. And you can check that out, like, the entire list. Basically, all the big SNES, you know, Super Nintendo system games that you could think of. This is a cool story. I hope for it because I've been thinking about getting Nintendo Switch online personally uh, because it's cheaper and because of their little classic game collection that you get if you do it. But it's only NES titles right now. But if they do SNES, there's a lot of those games that I really miss and that age beautifully well. You know what I mean? Like, you could play them right now and they still play perfectly. Um, Especially Yoshi's Island. I want to play Yoshi's Island again. I miss that one. The art style of that game is beautiful. Um, but yeah, that's a nice little positive story. Um, but unfortunately on the Nintendo front, a little bit of a sad story here. Reading from Polygon, Nintendo reboots Metroid Prime 4 and taps Retro Studios to restart the project. Nintendo has delayed Metroid Prime 4. Nintendo is rebooting the project and shifting development to Retro Studios, the Metroid Prime series' original developer, according to a statement from Shinya Takahashi senior managing executive officer at Nintendo. And quote, the current development progress has not reached the standards we seek in a sequel to the Metroid Prime series, Takahashi said in a development update video post on YouTube. And quotes, Nintendo always strives for the highest quality in our games, and in the development phase, we challenge ourselves and confront whether the game is living up to that quality on a daily basis. So yeah, guys, um, it's, 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 this is, this is sad. But, you know, it's it's cool that the, I think that a lot of people are kind of praising Nintendo for being so transparent about this and saying, hey, like we need this is what's going to happen. We're not going to lie to you and say why it's not coming out. We're just going to say, hey, straight up, we want this to be as good as possible. 
And at least we now know is that Retro Studios, who developed the original Metroid Prime games and one of the better uh, studios out there that Nintendo has, especially, um, that they're developing it, and that can only mean good things for the quality of the game, which I think that is all they're looking for because it's not like M- Metroid is a system seller. I don't think it is at all, actually. Um, it's an important series, and it's good, but it is nowhere near as valuable as, you know, say some of their Mario titles and Legend of Zelda and whatnot. Um, but still, um, sad to see that it gets delayed, but I think that people like that they're being so transparent. Or it's just this kind of media Nintendo bump. There's a lot of people in the media that kind of give Nintendo a lot of passes on a lot of things, which I could go into later. I don't uh, go into more in more depth at a later time, but, you know, whatever. Um, and the last thing is Kingdom Hearts 3 is coming out this week. This is not an actual news story, really. I'm just saying that it's coming out this week, comes out tomorrow. Uh... I hope to get my hands on it, and I'm going to have Adam Grassani, who, for those who don't know, he has his own sport here. I mean, um, own show here on WMSC. He's a big uh, member. He also writes for the Montclarian on sports. Uh, he's going to come on towards the end of next week's show to talk about Kingdom Hearts 3 because he's a huge Kingdom Hearts fan, uh, sometimes disturbingly so, and we're going to talk about it. Hopefully, I'll be able to play it sometime later in the week or this weekend so I can be able to keep up because Adam is a big Kingdom Hearts fan. As for me, I am a humongous fan of the original game. Everything after that, I have my problems with, which we'll talk about next week. So yeah, guys, uh, just the fact that this game is coming out this week is incredible. It's been in development for like 600 years. It's been 13 years since the last game, the last proper game, Kingdom Hearts 2. came out for the PlayStation 2 back in like 06, 05. So it's pretty, in- it's, it's, it's incredible. Um, and that's it for your gaming news. And for Reads of the Week... Only one I'm going to put right now is Bill Simmons' trade column piece, which is on The Ringer, which you can check out. Um, I don't necessarily agree with everything he says in it, but it's just a really well-organized thing to look at. And you know what I mean? Like, I just think it looks well for all the Hoops fans out there. And I put that in there just because um, just because this morning it was reported that uh, Anthony Davis requested a trade. So I just feel like this is a relevant thing to, to kind of plug in right there. Um, and that's basically it. Um, I also wrote my own thing. Um, uh, 12 Smashing Facts about the Super Smash Brothers games franchise. Uh, for You can check that out on mentalfloss.com, which is where I've been interning. Um, if you'd like, you could check that out. But just in general, my major read of the week is the Montclarian is back, everybody. I'm one of the assistant editors there, the entertainment section. Um, and there's really a lot of cool stuff that you can check out every week there. Um, lots of reviews, profile features, um, features on uh, commencement addresses and there's just so many good people working um, behind that. A lot of cool opinion pieces, too. I haven't written yet for the semester for the paper, but I plan to be soon, so you should stay tuned for that. Um, and, you know, you could check it out, like, every Thursday. The hard copy issue of the paper is you can find it throughout campus in various bins and whatnot and what have you. Um, and also you could check it out on um, themontclarion.org. Um, and follow me on Twitter if you would like to, at Opinion, which is spelled J-A-V-I-I-P-E-N-O. And I oftentimes tweet out a bunch of the articles and plug everybody's stuff so you can check that out. But yeah, guys, that's enough for the gaming and that's enough for the opening dash, which went about an hour. Sorry about that. It's just I'm really, really trying to stretch out time right now. You know what I mean? It's just what I'm trying to do. Um, but we're going to take a little bit of a break. And when we get back, hopefully I'm going to have my friend Alex Vitas call into the show, talk about the Super Bowl. It's going to be a lot of fun. Stay tuned, guys. Listen, 90.3 WMSC, Upper Montclair. We just passed the top of the hour, too. See you. See you in a little bit currently his name is alex vitas the pure one as some would say actually not the pure one i've already given that title to somebody else mr alex vitas are you on the line sir pop how's it going man how's it going man <laughs> dude it's pretty good i had um just came back from class uh digital communications ah. uh first class of the semester it wasn't bad it wasn't um bad. i have to write bad. a thesis on that but you know, everything's been going well this uh, this morning so far. How about you? It's been going great, man. <laughs> Thank you. So polite, ladies and gentlemen. So polite, Mr. Alex Vitas. <laughs> um, so, yeah, every yeah, time every yeah. time someone comes on the show for the first time, I let them, if they want, introduce themselves, say what they do or whatnot. Or you don't have to say anything. It's whatever you want. So Yeah, so f- first off, I want to just say that this is such a huge honor for me. I've always wanted to come on the Digital Dash. This is actually one of my favorite shows <laughs> uh, to listen to. And yeah, so I'm basically I'm a senior at UMass Amherst. Uh, I'm accounting. I'm an accounting major. Yeah, real fun. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I I'm a I'm a diehard Patriots fan. Um, 
And I, I think that's why I'm here on the show today. Yeah, man, that's exactly why you're on the show today, because, well, more for more than one reason. First of all, you're one of my really close friends, you, Cav, and I, Mike Cavalier, who's been on the show before. He's he's a coward, though, today and couldn't show up. He might be listening as far as we know, but I don't know. Um, and we've been have so. our we've had our Holy Grail group chat since, I think, sophomore year of high school, which is when you then left to Canada. You retreated. Is what you did. Yep. Yeah, you yeah. did. And we still talk through that group chat to this day still, though. And I've wondered over the years how we haven't killed you. And the reason why I wonder this is because you're a Patriots fan. Yeah. The the scourge of America, the New England Patriots, as, as many would say. Many experts with all the best qualifications would say that. Um, <laughs> and how does it feel? Because I, I have to wonder. You know what I mean? Like, what... How does it feel, first of all, being a Patriots fan, and second of all, being a Patriots fan, and third of all, being a Patriots fan when you know everyone hates the Patriots? Like, how does that feel? Yeah, it's, I mean, over the years, you've um, been able to, I've, like, learned how to cope with that. I mean, growing (laughs) up in New Jersey, especially, like, in 07 and 2011, that was the worst Mm -hmm. because you're going up against Giants fans. and, 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 And I was, like, one of the only Patriots fans in the school. Yeah, that's fair to say. That's fair. Whenever something would happen to the Patriots, it would just, yep, I would be like, get, they, somebody would come at me, or, yeah, it'd be just like that. And mm-hmm. just being a Patriots fan, I, I kind of feel spoiled a little bit. Right. Uh, that kind of sounds bad, but like winning all these games and knowing that your regular season really doesn't start until January. <laughs> so, yeah, it's kind of true. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, I mean, it's awesome being a Patriots fan. Um, but, <laughs> because I mean, you win a you lot, get so, much, get so much junk for it. But you learn to cope with it over the years. Right, right, right. And I think what's interesting is you now, since you're going to UMass, it must be a lot easier, probably. <laughs> I could assume because you're in Massachusetts now, so it's like you're kind of amongst the people, if if I may say so. Yeah, it's really easy. It, I people just talk about the Patriots all the time now. That I think that's the number one team on campus, probably. Mm-hmm. Uh, either that or the Red Sox. Um, but, yeah, p- all, people always talk about it. Um, and most people on campus uh, are Patriots fans. They're from the Boston area. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, it's it's nice to be amongst people that, <laughs> that I mean, I guess, uh, have the same, like, the same teams as you. Right. And it's really easy. Yeah. So, like. But I don't know. Like, me, my personality, I like being the instigator a little bit. <laughs> and. So that's kind of annoying. I get that. I get so, that. Yeah. You're not like the typical sense of an instigator, though. I think when people think of instigator, they think of this like raging lunatic type that's like crazy. You're like behind the scenes, I think. You're really the behind the scenes types, you know, where you're like, yeah, I, you're like I ready to go. Very low key. Yeah, very low key about it. You'll you'll like sneak a little comment in there. You know what I mean? In our group chats or in person, you'll just sneak a little thing in there. And that's when it yeah. starts. And that's when the war begins. You know it's like I mean? a, you'll see it when you'll see it. Like you, I'll, I'll sneak something in there. And I won't hide it, but you'll if <laughs> I won't show it to you like explicitly, but you'll see it when you see it. Yeah, you exactly. know what I mean. <laughs> you'll see it when you see it. That's exactly right. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what it is. Um, but I'm wondering because I barely know this either. What exactly made you become? Because you're also a Celtics fan. Um, yeah. What exactly made you become like such a fervent uh, Boston fan in the sense of the Celtics and the Patriots? Like growing up, like what was it for you? Well, okay, so I can specifically talk about the Patriots. Um, so I'd say in 2003, um, when they were going to the Super Bowl, one of my friends from class was a Patriots fan too. Mm-hmm. And so I'm like, you know what? He's my friend. You know what? I'm a Patriots fan too. <laughs> wow, <laughs> why really? not? Yeah, why not? I'm going to root for the Patriots. <laughs> That's so, actually pretty fun so, reasoning. I swear, yeah. So I started rooting for the. I wrote, wrote like started rooting for the Patriots, not knowing anything about them. Just I was rooting for them, and then my, like I'm like, Dad, I'm a Patriots fan. I guess in 2003 <laughs> when I was like six. Dad, I'm he's a like, Patriots oh, fan. you know your entire like mom's side of the family are Patriots fans too. I'm like, well, I didn't know that. My mom, I mean, my, I guess my mom's she is a Patriots fan, but she didn't really, she wasn't like an all out fan, I'd say, but she was a Patriots fan. Like my grandfather, father is a huge Boston sp- uh, sports fan. Mm-hmm. So just from them living in Massachusetts and my mom growing up in Massachusetts um, made me uh, a huge Patriots fan and kind of grew that. 
Mm-hmm. So, I'm, but I'm not going to even lie. Like, if the Giants were probably winning at that time, I'd probably be a Giants fan. <laughs> but but I, yeah, just I like, like it. I appreciate your 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 honesty, though. I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. But just from the Patriots winning and my family being from Massachusetts, mm-hmm. that's basically why I'm a Patriots fan. And along those lines, is similar to why I'm a Celtics fan. Well, because like everybody in my family is a Celtics fan, including my dad. My dad's actually a Dolphins fan. I don't. He's like he liked Dan Marino, so he, okay. he's a Dolphins fan. Okay. But everybody in my family is a Celtics fan, and um, yeah, that's basically why I'm a Celtics fan. It's just for my family. But yeah, like that's that's actually like solid reason. I mean, it's better than mine for like the Chargers. Yeah, um, why are you I a mean, Chargers fan? That's why. I well, know. yeah, because the Chargers were basically, I was a loser in middle school, and everyone made fun of me for liking video game stuff. And oh, I yeah. only, even though I was a baseball fan, I liked the Yankees a lot, but I guess people like to choose what was cool and what not cool because yeah. I had a bunch of stuck up kids in my class when I was younger. And so I decided like, I need, I need to get into football. And I ended up actually just naturally liking it and not faking it. And what happened yeah. is, you know, how my mind worked. I like Sonic the Hedgehog. So I like things that were fast when I was younger. Yeah. And then I saw the little lightning bolt on one of the teams helmets. So I was like, whoa, I like this team. And then I watched them a couple times, and what really sealed the deal is because as someone who knows nothing about football, I knew the name Peyton Manning. You know what I mean? I knew what that name was. I yeah. heard of it. And I knew Tom Brady. Like, you know what I mean? At the time, like, I know who those names are. And then I remember watching the playoff game against the Colts when they beat them, this, this lightning bolt team. And then from there, I was just like, all right, cool, I'm a Chargers fan. I think it's yeah. okay when you're younger. When you're a kid, everyone says, like, this the bandwagon stuff – Every kid when they're younger, they're not, like, old enough to like teams, in my opinion, other than just who wins. You know what I mean? Yep. Like, if you're a kid, you're not going to be like, oh, I'm a big Browns fan. I like the, the color of their uniform or I like this one player. No, you're going to be like, I want to like things that are going to make me happy and win. You know what I mean? I think that's just how kids operate. So, you know what I mean? Exactly. So, I think that if you were older, maybe, you might have – it's potentially – maybe me too. Actually, I think I would have stayed a Chargers fan for those reasons. Um but like you might have been like, oh, I like the, I don't know the the Rams now or the Cardinals or like random teams. I'm trying to think of a fun one. Uh, it's, yeah, it's like yeah. It's it all like depends all when you're younger. Just... You know what I mean? And I don't like yeah, the, every reasoning for everyone liking a team is arbitrary in my opinion. If we want to get into the whole location based thing, I think that's kind of silly too. It's like, oh, I just like wherever I'm from. Like no, yeah. there should be a little bit more to it. I think sometimes too. So yeah, I'm not gonna bash on you for that. Although we hate the Patriots, I do remember. <laughs> It's still on Twitter, the text that after the Atlanta game last year, when you said good morning, and then Gab was like, you know, he said a certain thing. That's still Wait, on what? Twitter. This is what he said, you know, F you, um, just after you said good morning the next day after they beat the Falcons. It was incredible. Like, are we, it's amazing that the beef hasn't really grown more and more. I think sometimes we forget that you're a Patriots fan, just every now and then. Like, we want to pretend yeah. that it isn't real. <laughs> we just want to pretend that it's not the case. <laughs> just justify it to ourselves. Um, so let me let me ask you, how was it last year? I'm not. I'm going to let you, you know, praise the glory of the Patriots in a little bit. But first, I got to get into what happened last year because our good friend Mike Cavalier is an Eagles fan. And what, like, what was that like for you last year? It, it was honestly that day. I remember that. I, I didn't cry. No, I didn't cry. But it was honestly like one of the worst, ex- one of the worst experiences, one of the worst games I've ever seen, because it, like I, I really did not see that coming. I didn't know they're gonna lose by that. Like they gave up over forty points to the Eagles <laughs> to Nick Foles, and I was like, oh my goodness, I really didn't think that was going to happen. Um, I didn't think that Nick Foles had it in him, and Whoa. I really, the, well, the, the Eagles, savior, I didn't see man. them as a threat as all at all. After, especially after Carson Wentz went down, I'm like, oh yeah, they're the number one. Does not mean anything, yeah. and you know, it it just caught me off guard. And then you you put in the fact that Mike Cavalier is an Eagles fan too. Oh my goodness, that that like those two combined just just killed me. <laughs> and I I really I was so depressed the next day. I remember I walked into tax class. And there, it, it was actually every. I think everybody was depressed because there was like no. It was just silence. Nobody was talking. <laughs> and I can imagine it was. Yeah, it was crazy. Like I, nobody wanted to talk to each other. Mm-hmm. And I really didn't like. I was kind of. I was not depressed, but I was sad for like a couple of days until Wednesday, mm-hmm. when I shot like Mike Cavett text. I I think I sent this in the group. I said, 
you know what? You guys deserve to win, which they did. They really did mm-hmm. deserve to win. The acceptance but phase I, of grief. I see. Yeah, I accepted them. I, yeah, I'm like, you know what? You guys <laughs> deserve to win. It, you guys, they straight up beat us. Yeah. I mean, our secondary could not stop a nosebleed, if uh, I want to quote Bart <laughs> Scott, you feel me? But <laughs> <laughs> it was, it, yeah, but they couldn't stop. Um, and then Brady, I mean, Brady, Brady played pretty well. Yeah, he, I um, think he played pretty great, actually. I know a lot of people have to, you know, I hate top Brady, but. I know a lot of people like to jump on him for really weird reasons, and it gets me mad because I'm like, guys, stop. You know what I mean? Like, stop. He didn't do anything bad this time. He dropped one pass, but I think people like to forget he threw for, like, 500 yards in the Super Bowl. Yeah. Like, he had a pretty it, yeah. good game. <laughs> like, what are we talking about? Exactly. It's not his fault that the defense dropped, like, a, a 60 bomb. on They got a 60 bomb dropped on them or whatever it was. I forgot what the final score even was of that game. But um, – Another thing is with the with the Pats is, you know, you just came off of the game against Atlanta, and then you have this Philly game. The Atlanta game, I remember I was talking to one of your friends when we visited um, a while ago, where I was like, you know, if everything meant like made sense, they would have beaten the Giants twice, but then lost to Atlanta and Seattle. You know what I mean? If like things yeah. made sense, because I mean, I really think the Seattle thing's just ridiculous. I mean, <laughs> that was, the, yeah. yeah that what was, was that the, like? I got to ask you now. Was, what, what was that like? Well, what was that like seeing the Seahawks decide we have this awesome running back at the one yard line who just ran for like 10 yards. Let's not give him the ball and then run the play that hasn't actually worked for us all year, which is that inside cross route that they did. Yeah, that was ridiculous. I was honestly, I was just rewatching the game yesterday, the Seahawks game. And it, 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 it like boggles my mind why they didn't run the ball. But you think about it. I, was, I remember I was watching the game. I was like, Bill, what are you doing? There's like they're running down the clock. Mm-hmm. You know Marshawn's gonna score. You need all this time to score, like to score again. Why aren't you calling a timeout? And he was just letting the clock go down. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if he knew something that we didn't know. But I don't think I mean, he did. I think I really just think they just they yeah, lucked I don't, out. I don't know. I think they kind of lucked out, I, and I, I think really Pete Carroll tried to get cute. I don't believe in this nonsense that like Simmons, who we love, we both probably we both love Simmons. Who's like, I, th- I really think he Jedi mind tricked them. No, he did it. He was probably just like, uh, what do we do? Like, this is crazy. We're about to lose to Seattle off of this insane catch that unfortunately is never going to be remembered. Uh, whoever that Seattle Seahawks receiver is, uh, Jermaine, Jermaine Curse, yeah. uh, who's now on, not, not on the Seahawks anymore. But like that crazy catch he makes that bounces off his foot. He was probably just flabbergasted and didn't know what to do. And if, and if Pete Carroll took that as, oh no, Pete, Bill. Uh, Belichick's planning something right now. No, he did it. He just, he had a, he was like, it's whatever. These people aren't perfect, as close as can be to perfect with Bill Belichick's case. But, you know, um, I think that the Pats, they really are the scourge of the nation. But I will say one thing this year is what's getting me annoyed with them is a couple things. But the main thing is this idea that they're underdogs that Julian oh. Edelman has been pushing. And it's really annoying me. Now, first of all, I will say this. Objectively speaking, they were not good this year. Like, they were not a very good team this year. They had the blown game against the Dolphins. The Steelers, the 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 real housewives of Pittsburgh somehow beat them. Um, yeah. Like, the Patriots, Lions. objectively speaking, didn't look all that great this year. So I don't like this, this thing that they're kind of pushing that everyone doubted them. And it's like, yeah, we kind of did because you guys just straight up didn't look good. Now, I wasn't like everybody else who was saying, oh, the Chargers got this in the bag. I thought that was a mistake. And I think people don't <laughs> actually watch football sometimes. I'm like, aren't they like 18-0 and at home or whatever it is? Or 18-1 and with Mark Sanchez being the only one to beat them for some reason. Um, and bottom line is it's still Tom Brady. And I think there's this narrative that was pushed this year through media and through fans and through Twitter, I guess, that Brady was having like that Peyton Manning last year. Not last year, like his last season where he couldn't throw the ball anymore. I think people were starting to compare it to that, which is more evidence to the fact that people really don't watch football sometimes. And people just want the Patriots to finally be bad. And trust me, I want them to be bad really badly. <laughs> like, I'm waiting for it. But I'm, I think yeah. a lot of people are trying to jump on case to be able to say, I was the one who finally called it when the Patriots would be bad. Everyone's trying to, like, be the first person to say that. I love the Trent Dilfers of the world, if you know what I mean, because I know you're a big fan of his. Um, yeah, I love him. <laughs> Trent Dilfer. Uh, for those who don't know, just look up Trent Dilfer. Patriots aren't good anymore. Um, which him, he and, said... him and Max Kellerman are the worst, I swear. <laughs> Kellerman, it's yeah, funny. Kellerman's the new Trent Dilfer, dude. He, it's, it's funny because I like so Kellerman. Bad. I like Kellerman, but I think that he's – I just think he's smarter than what he's saying, and I think he's 
intentionally just saying hot takes. Oh, I don't know. It's just me. I think he's smart, and I think he like Skip Bayless. I think actually believes what he says. I really do. Um, like he convinces himself of it. <laughs> I think that I think um, Max Kellerman is kind of smarter than that, and I think he's not trying to do. But since he's on first take, he kind of has to almost have the hot takes, um, per se. Yeah. Um, Stephen A. is just. I mean, you and I both agree. Is just if I could have dinner with one person in the world, it would be Stephen A. Smith. Um, so that that's really, really, uh, really the thing with it. Now let's talk about this Sunday, because we we spent a lot of time talking about the Pats and their history and your history with them. How are you, how are you feeling? How are you feeling for the Sunday? What's your mind going into potentially a six Super Bowl championship? Um, I have no expectations because. I, had, I I feel like this is like as a result of last year where I had so many expectations and mm-hmm. I I just can't like I I can't too, get too excited about this because last year I think that's what happened and it just it was awful. That Super Bowl is one of the worst I've ever seen. Mm-hmm. Well, no, 07 was even worse than yeah, last year. Yeah, I mean 07 year, but... has to be worse because they had the the undefeated season, right? And then the yeah, and, I... and then the loss to them again, the same team. Although the second time you guys played them the it was a little bit less of an upset, in my opinion. The Giants were like yeah, pretty was. good that year, but undefeated year they were like, if you looked on Madden, they would probably have a ninety nine overall in every category. Yeah, def- yeah, that's definitely true. Um, and I like you can't, I can't have any expectations. Like I had a friend last year, and he was like the entire year, he, like even before the playoff, he's like, oh Brady is going to win the Super Bowl, and he's going to be like Michael uh, Michael Jordan, and he's going to put up six uh, like six fingers. <laughs> to like indicate six rings i'm like oh my goodness like you can't do that man like and i'm like actually no i actually i was going along with them like dude yeah you, you know you know what you're right <laughs> i was but now going this along year, with I'm like dude you can't do that like you can't do that dude you can't like jinx this mm-hmm. <laughs> this is like it's kind of like walking on egg sh- shows right um and out of the um out of the super bowls i've seen so like so i so the first super bowl i remember was in 03 as i mentioned before I think this team is the Rams team that we're facing is probably the third best team that we've faced in the Super Bowl. Yeah, um, it's a pretty I, good one, but they're also I, young, so I don't really know what to say with that. And they also don't have fans, apparently. So that's another yeah, tragedy. <laughs> if you've seen those videos, oh my gosh! I know, yeah, it's I know it's. Let's put it's, two teams in LA. Good job, the NFL. Good job. I know. I I don't know what they're, what they're gonna do with that. Mm-hmm. I, I think that was a mistake, but whatever. And. So I think they're the third best team. I think that the Seahawks in 2014 were was the be- best team the Patriots ever played, and I think that the Falcons were the second best team. And then you put the Rams there. Mm-hmm. Um, I I I think the I mean the Rams have every I think they have every advantage mostly. Yeah, except mostly. for the quarterback. Yeah, I'd say it except for quarterback and coach. And and the secondary. Well, I think the pitchers have a better secondary than the Rams. Yeah, I, I was gonna say coach, but to be fair, McVay is still really good. This is it's like it's like having a one A and the, it's like having a ninety five overall versus a ninety overall. Or it's like they're st- they're both really good, but so I won't say it's a clear advantage there necessarily. But yeah, at quarterback, I'd say the advantage is, is definitely there. I mean, I thought that the Pats got a little bit lucky, not not Rams level of lucky in their playoff game. But I thought yeah. they got a little bit fortunate with some of the calls that went their way. But also, bottom line is Brady had like on the the third down plays, like all passes that were right on target to Edelman. And I can't stand that guy. I'm like wondering how he's open all the time. The Chargers game, I yeah. almost threw my head, like decapitated myself because I was like, oh yeah, let's r- line up 17 DBs against Julian Edelman, who for years just does that little slant route on the inside every time. It's like, oh yeah, let's just let's just not cover him. It's like, what, I don't understand what people are doing sometimes. But anyway, um, yeah, I don't know how I, I just, I'd even text you. I was just like, GG, what was in like five minutes? <laughs> yeah, it was like that game. Time. I was so frustrated. I was like, you got to be kidding me, guys. Like, what are you, it's just like a, what are you doing game? You know what I mean? Like, it wasn't all on Rivers. Like, some people have tried to say it's not, it's not his fault that the yeah. Pats scored in three minutes <laughs> or it felt like three minutes. And I was just like, this is terrible. I knew it was going to a bad place. When they elected to um, to defer, I think it was. Or no, they elected to receive the kick. The Pats, I mean. That's when I got yeah. nervous. I was going to text him and be like, oh, no. Because they never do that. And whenever the Pats change from something that they've been doing a lot all season for the current game they're in, that gets me nervous. So I was like, oh, no. They elected to receive. This isn't good. This isn't a good sign. And what do you know? We don't have coaches who know how to couple Julian Edelman. So there's that. 
Um, but for this game, I think that, you know, I personally think the Pats are going to win. I'm not doing that reverse jinx thing. I'm not. I don't like – I'm just – I'm trying to be respectful. I think they're going to win. It just feels like – no offense, they like to lose to quarterbacks in the Super Bowl that aren't the best quarterbacks in the league that year, <laughs> a la Eli Manning and Nick Foles. That just seems to be their kryptonite and Mark Sanchez. Yeah. I don't know what it is. <laughs> it's just their kryptonite is the <laughs> not best quarterback. They can beat Peyton. They can beat Rivers. They can beat Breeze, Roethlisberger. But, no, they can't beat Joe Flacco sometimes. They can't beat Eli oh, Manning. Oh, yeah, Joe Flacco. Joe Flacco. Joe, Flu- uh, Joe Flacco, am I right? Uh, elite, is he elite? Um <laughs> And with this game, I think that the the big thing behind it, I'm wondering what's happening to Todd Gurley right now, where he's kind of just been inept and he hasn't been able to play well. And he really, like, I feel like that might have been a bigger story, that he just had four carries for, I think, like 15 yards in the last game um, against the Saints. But they're like, oh, yeah, let's just move on. Like, that's kind of crazy that this franchise running back just isn't playing well right now. And I don't know what that says about the current – you know, kind of perception of running backs in the league and how they're replaceable and all this stuff. Um, what is – what are – now let's move on to just, like, Super Bowl in general. Like, what does it feel like when you're when it's not your team in the Super Bowl? How does that feel for you? Because I'm wondering, like, do you have, like, a Super Bowl party? Do you – are you a big fan of commercials? I don't know. Are you a big fan of the halftime show? All that stuff. Unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> um no, I, I, yeah, I still, I, I mean, I like the, watching the Super Bowl still when the Patriots are in, aren't in it, like that rare time that they're not in it. Yeah. And I, like, I always, I, like, I choose a team. There's always a team that I want to win. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, like, yeah, I have, like, a Super Bowl party. Um, I always, yeah, yeah, I always look forward to the commercials. I think that the commercials are always funny. Mm-hmm. Um, and halftime, in the halftime show, I, I, yeah, I mean, sometimes it's hit or miss with the halftime show, I think. Yeah, um, I agree. This year, I think, it's going to be good. Um, well, Maroon 5, they're all right, but I, tra- I think Travis Scott's going to be good. Mm-hmm. I don't think he's going to be as nuts as he usually is, though. Yeah, I mean, they're probably going to have him filtered because it's the Super Bowl, and the NFL yeah. like, has this clean product idea, despite the fact that they're, you know, advertising beer and all that stuff, but whatever. Um, I think that... One thing I've always hated about the halftime show, they love to get people who are like 10 years past their prime, who are like objectively, yeah. they had a moment where they were really good, like Maroon 5, who's, you know, they, they have some good songs and whatnot. They're cool. Um, but they, and Lady Gaga actually is one of the rare exceptions where I think they got her t- a little bit early. I think it would have been cool if she was doing it this year because, you know, with the star is born, like, I think that would have been like a cool kind of connection to make Um, have Bradley Cooper come on stage and all that stuff. That would have been fun. Um, yeah. But I think for the most part, you know, they had Madonna one year. They had the Black Eyed Peas. They've had, like, who they had? They had Justin Timberlake last year for some reason. I don't really know why. Yeah, have we, have we figured out why they had Justin Timberlake as the person last year? We still haven't figured it out, right? I don't no, think we I have don't yet. even remember. That's how, like, rem- that's how good that performance was. I really just don't remember that one. <laughs> yeah, I don't. All I remembered was the Prince <laughs> tribute, which was shockingly actually not bad. Um, yeah. He actually did a pretty good job at that. Um, and I think that. A lot of times, like, you know, people are past their prime and whatnot. The only exception for me is Bruno Mars. That's the best yep. halftime oh, show yeah. I've ever seen. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. So you're pro oh, Bruno yeah. Mars, which is good. He's a great performer. And, we'll, I mean, he's a person who his halftime show, unequivocally, without a doubt, was better than the game. Like, no <laughs> doubt in my mind. This is the, the Broncos-Seahawks game, which was oh, yeah. one of the great travesties in the history of the Super Bowl. Uh, like, without a doubt, was better than the game. <laughs> It was like thirty-five to six by the by yeah. the time it was the halftime show, um, and he was just incredible. And then the next year they they kind of ran it back. This time they had Coldplay and Beyonce and Bruno Mars came in too. Um, this year though, like you mentioned with Travis Scott, I'm really curious to see it. I actually think this one might be good. I think Maroon Five is is solid, albeit I think that it's weird that you go to Atlanta and this is the act that you choose for it, given the history of you know the more hip hop. Um, history that i think they have from there and you decide to go with maroon five it's a little bit weird but they yeah, also I, if you saw their little super bowl uh sorry to cut you off there their little super bowl like announcement video i don't know if you saw that um where they showed spongebob for a quick second wait what their little like video where they said like you know we're gonna be at the super bowl they showed like a like little clips of asap rocky for like half a second i think and then they also showed a clip from spongebob 
I don't know if you've seen this. No, I didn't see that. Yeah, and it's basically because I don't know if you heard the story ever since the creator of SpongeBob died. Um, people had like the petition to play Sweet Victory from the the hit band Geeks episode to play that at the Super oh, Bowl. Oh yeah, 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 yep. Um, and they showed like a little bit of a snippet of SpongeBob. So what I'm thinking is they might do that at the Super Bowl. That gets me very, very excited, Alex. Very, very excited. What about you? You know what, Javier? I do agree with that. <laughs> I think that um, it, it would just be one of those things. I doubt. I mean, I'm not. I'm not doubting it now since it looks like they all but kind of confirmed it themselves. Maroon Five. Um, but I don't know what that sound was. Um, but I think that now nah, I lost my train of thought. What was I saying? Let me think. Ah, that's right. I think that no, I lost it again. What was I saying, Alex? <laughs> Dude, I don't know. It just like the phone just like came in and out, so I just had no like it started beeping. I'm like, okay. <laughs> so I have no clue. You you were talking about the Sponge. I remember we were talking about the SpongeBob halftime show. Right. Right. Yeah. Okay. 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 And I was okay. saying that this will be the greatest halftime show of all time if they do that. Right. Okay. Did you say that? And yeah, <laughs> I, I want to add that. Wow. here that, I mean, yeah, that I think I do agree with you that maybe more of a hip hop influence would have been good for mm-hmm. Atlanta. I think, yeah, it's like Maroon 5's just trying to sprinkle that in a little bit. I mean, Travis Scott's not from Atlanta, but I think they have yeah. Big Boy, right? I think they do. Is he from? I think and they I'm, do. I'm not entirely sure. And I'm pretty... He's from the South. I'm pretty sure he's from... Yeah, he's from Georgia, Savannah, Georgia. So, yeah, he's from around. Mm-hmm. He's, like, from area, around. So. It feels more like not completely tone deaf at this point. Um, no, but you should have had like Andre three thousand. Yeah, they should have had that. They should have had that. Like maybe Outcast is Outcast from there. Oh yeah, that's Outcast. Yeah, Put Outcast. Them together. Yeah, that would have been cool. Um, but they didn't do it. But it's okay, I guess. You know what I mean? Like it's it's fine. Um, now I'm just looking at my notes. Um, what was else was I gonna say? Um, I think that another thing with the Super Bowl, like we were saying with the commercials. Um, one thing I've always been a fan of is I always like to listen to um or like watch the movie trailers because sometimes they reveal cool stuff for the movies. Um, and you know, this, this past year that they revealed, um, like solo last year, which was really cool. They hadn't shown a uh, solo star Wars story. Of course they hadn't really shown, um, anything in regards to the movie before that, that little sneak peek of the Super Bowl. So I always look forward to that personally. I don't know about you. Um, I don't know if you knew this, but I'm a big movie guy for sure. Um, no. So, so, uh, I'm really looking forward to that. Um, but yeah, man, um, Super Bowl, are you excited? Like, are you, are you feeling okay? I, I have to like check your heartbeat. Like, are you okay right now? Are yeah, you, are I you living? Watch, yeah, I'm living, dude. I like, I'm not trying to think about it too much. Uh, I haven't like watched any like TV shows or like analysis on the Super Bowl because frankly, like frankly, it doesn't even matter because that's like the really good thing about football is that anybody can win on any given Sunday. Right. So like you can analyze the game all you want. It like, it really doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. So I am trying to not look uh, in too much into it. Right. And also I want to say that um, I'm really excited to have another game with Tony Romo. Right. Yeah. Tony Romo. Dude, a a big, 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 big weekend for Tony Romo, man. Oh my gosh. I can't wait. He's great. Greatest commentator of all time. (laughs) Yeah, I think he solidified himself as that already. He he's awesome, dude. He's really good. He's really really good. I have to say, yeah, he's really good. Um, yeah, him. Mm-hmm. I think that it's good because you know I forget who we even usually have at the Super Bowl. I think we have Collinsworth sometimes. Um, I'm really he's good too. Yeah, I think that Romo, like he just he had such a big week with all the plays that he called and and whatnot. He really just called everything. Um, and I think that. One of the other elements that I'm looking for for the game is just to see him him gush about Tom Brady, is to have his oh man he's so good oh like oh, that that Jim, I'm oh, gonna... oh Jim better look Jim. at the right side oh <laughs> like his little like he's just such a fan and I've also enjoyed the little like kind of rumors that this has helped his stock to like come back to the league <laughs> like I really like oh, that my. idea um, Tony yes. Romo solid quarterback. But he's had some moments that aren't very good, um, just objectively speaking. He's had some bad um, performances in the bigger spotlight um, over the course of his career, thankfully. Because the Cowboys might be the only team that I hate more than the Patriots, honestly, in all sports. Because at least the Patriots win. You know what I mean? At least they do win. The Cowboys oh, yeah. don't. Um, and yet they are – they're really like the Kardashians of sports. They really are. Um, well, 
Yeah. Um. So yeah, man. Also, just a side note. I saw you earlier like the Shams' tweet about Anthony Davis. Just, just the, the classic oh, yeah. entitled Boston fans. They think they're getting Anthony Davis now. And, they, and they think that they're going to get him by giving up Terry Rogier and a second round pick is probably what they want. <laughs> hey, I like that as a basketball fan. I don't, I don't, I don't know if he's coming to the the Celtics. Um, if we if we trade from, we're probably going to have to give up like Jason Tatum. I don't, I don't, I don't really want to give up Jason Tatum. Mm-hmm. I give for up Anthony Jim Davis. Brown. Yeah, for Anthony Davis. No, we're going to give up more, obviously. But like, I don't want to give up. I mean, he's good. Okay. No, yeah, I'm saying I'm about, saying you wouldn't want to give up Jason Tatum for Anthony Davis. Oh my, my dude, my friends like we have the same debate. I, dude, I, I don't know. I don't like. I really like Jason Tatum, um, but then again, like I was thinking about this in the shower this morning, that mm-hmm. uh, like Anthony Davis is like a t- he's arguably like number top five player. I put like ahead LeBron, um, James Harden. Yeah, um, that's fair. Uh, who? I don't know. I had this whole debate to. Oh, Gia- Giannis. Giannis, huh? Um, no, actually, that's debatable. You could say that Davis is better than Giannis. No, I get that. I mean, it's a fair take. You know what I mean? It's a fair take. I get it. Oh, and I I'm think with Steph it. Steph Curry and Durant are better than um than Anthony Davis. But uh, yeah, I don't know. It, it's I I like. I feel like Jason Tatum is gonna be really good, but he needs. He can't have that Mamba m- mentality, like. Like there's a certain amount of Mamba mentality that's good, but that when you're shooting like 20 shots a game and making like seven, that's not that's not what you want to see. Yeah, I agree, man. But yeah, man, it's it's I, I just I'm just trying not to hate you too much for being a Pats fan. Like that's I just keep coming back to this. I'm sorry. Like it's really hard. Dude, <laughs> you think we'll be we would be friends if I was a uh, a Pats fan, Pats fan, a Lakers fan, and a Yankees fan? Uh, let me see. I think the Lakers I could excuse. I think. think I don't really know, though. It depends. The problem is that you're not the typical Boston, like, yelling about it Boston fan. At least not to us. You know what I mean? You're not like, hey, oh, I don't even know. I can't even do a Boston accent, so I'm not even going to try. But you're never, like, like, braggadocious in the same way that I think Boston fans in my experience have been. So I don't really think it would affect anything too much. You're just not that, like... You're not the type of fan that at the game I feel like just, just like stands up and yells boo when the player like misses a ball or whatever. Uh, so I think that's why I hate those type of fans. I'm just like relax, like it's not the end of the world. My my yeah. other my other, the other fans that I hate are the people who bet on every type of sport at all times of the day. Could be betting on international oh, yeah. rugby. Like you can't watch it, yeah. And it's like, bro, like, and then what I don't like. You're allowed to bet, maybe. I mean, you're allowed to bet if you're in the right state or territory that allows it. Um, of course, but what I don't like is people that really complain because they bet on like a hockey game in mid October, you know what I mean? Like some random hockey game and that's not going well for them. And I'm like, relax, dude. Like it's sports. It's unpredictable. And it's the regular season. People are just going to, by default, lose to teams at some point that aren't as good as them. Just kind of what happens. You know what I mean? Um, exactly. But yeah, dude, you got, you got any like kind of final thoughts you got any final final words to share? How do you want to? You can do and do your uh, Pat's propaganda. I'll allow it. Just just this once. It's your first time on the show, or whatever else you want to spread. Yeah, I just want to say that I think Tom Brady is the greatest quarterback of all time. <laughs> okay. And uh, I think that uh, even if he loses the Super Bowl, he'll still be the greatest quarterback of all time. Mm-hmm. And going back to what you were saying about being an annoying annoying Pat's fan, uh, yeah, there are those people. Mm-hmm. Like this one guy, he's like saying, "Oh, wait, you you better wake up every morning and thank God that you're a you're a Patriots fan." <laughs> I think that's unbelievable, dude. Like, <laughs> thank God. Yeah, you know, I I I think I think I'd be more of a uh, more annoying if the Patriots maybe just won their first Super Bowl. Oh but yeah, that's fair. Is, but yeah, this is their ninth, and to be honest, it's it's just not worth it. <laughs> yeah, they could be obnoxious, but. That's true. It's they have a real like we've been there before attitude about them, and I agree though. If they lose this, nothing changes. I I I don't know enough about football history, but I can safely say as much as I hate to admit it, he's probably the best quarterback we've ever seen. I think Rodgers had a case at one point where he might have been there because he had the Super Bowl. Brady had three at the time, but you just look at like the statistical output and what he can do on the field, just like as a passer. Forget the accomplishments part. 
And I think Rodgers was like kind of like in that realm. But I mean, he's won two more. One of them being a twenty-eight three comeback. Another one just I, and he's he's like forty years old. I think that he's safely taken the torch from from that argument. And he's probably past Montana. So yeah, I think it's fair to say that he's he's the best ever. I mean, he's he's forty-one years old, and people should stop acting like he, every time he has an okay game that it's this is the end. You know what I mean? He was fine this year, guys. But like, I, I hate to break it to everybody. The Pats were not very good this year, but Brady he was fine. You know what I mean? He wasn't Peyton Manning his last year in Denver. He wasn't yeah. that bad. Um, and now he's saying he wants to keep playing, and he's been pushing it. The only thing, though, stop acting like you're underdogs. I'm not saying you specifically. I'm just like, stop. No, any, anybody who knows anything about sports knows that the Patriots can never be underdogs ever. Tom Brady has to be playing with one arm, and Bill Belichick has to be in a coma before they're ever considered an underdog, in my book anyway. You know, that's fair. I mean – Okay, I was a little mad about that this morning. There's a sports writer, writer that did tweet out <laughs> that's, that they are sick and tired of hearing about that as well. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I, I got it, took a little offense to that. But, it's, <laughs> I mean, it's fair. They're, they're never the underdogs. And I think it's what, – what's going on is just a bunch of people it's, – it's overreaction, as you said. Mm-hmm. Um, just a bunch of people overreacting to what they saw, to those, like, five games that they lost. Mm-hmm. And um, – yeah, it's. I don't think it's. Now that you say that, I'm not too mad about that. I'm not going to be too mad if you you say that the Patriots aren't the underdog, it would, mm. and they pro, and they are the favorite to win the Super Bowl. I think they're. Like yeah, and they probably three. should be. They probably should. Yeah, be. and I I think they should be. Um, but I think it'll be a good game against the Rams, definitely. All right, man. But yeah, that's about it. Um, I wish you no types of luck, and I hope to sending you. Uh, some kind of uh, taunting text. If they lose, I'm not crazy enough to send it before because then you get stuff like what happened with Atlanta. But I hope to make fun of the Patriots after uh, the events transpire fully on Sunday, Mr. Vitas. Hey, thanks, man. Can I just give uh, a couple shout-outs here? Go ahead, man. Um, obviously, I have to give uh, a shout-out to Mike Cav. <laughs> okay. Um, I hope you're, I hope you're w- listening. Mm-hmm. Um, also, I want to give out a shout out to your coworker, mm-hmm. uh, Mario Papa. <laughs> I love his show. Um, okay, I'll be sure to pass that along. Last semester was Mario's Monday Mojo. This semester is changed. Uh, the days have changed. Yeah, it's the this Tuesday toss up. Mario's Tuesday toss up. Yeah, uh, great show. I think he has great guests. Actually, really <laughs> interesting guests. Um, I like the one he did with Miss New Jersey. That that was a good one. <laughs> okay. Um, no, I just want to give a shout out to Yeah, him Mario does hope well. He, hope he continues doing what he does. Um, mm-hmm. And I want to give a shout out to you. Thank um, you. I think you have a great radio show. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that the Mental Floss is lucky to have you. <laughs> Thanks, man. <laughs> and uh, I, I also wish you uh, continued success because you deserve it. You are Mr. Pop. Uh, <laughs> and you write great things. Thanks, man. I really appreciate yeah. it. Thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. Thank you so no much, problem. man. All right, I'll see you around. All right, take care. And ladies and gentlemen, that was Alex Vitas calling in from Skype, as you just heard the boop, boop, boop at the end of that, um, just as we approached just past the top of the hour here on 90.3 WMSC Upper Montclair. Um, yeah, it was a fun conversation. I've, I wanted to have Vitas um, on the show for a really long time now, and I'm glad I finally got to do that and just kind of, you know, ramble about the Super Bowl and the Patriots and everything about football and rest assured he will probably be back again and maybe with Mr. Mike Cav who we've mentioned a lot who I've just kind of been destroying on Twitter over the past like two years honestly I just continuously own the kid and um, I've been owning him now because he tried to pretend that he could come on the show this morning and I didn't appreciate that Um, he got me all startled and whatnot but anyway um, yeah guys we're gonna take a little bit of a break and when we get back I'm going to talk about Spyro, the Reignited Trilogy, for a little bit, and then uh, my Oscars thoughts. So still plenty of show left uh, and plenty of things to talk about. So stay tuned, guys. You're listening to 90.3 WMSC, Upper Montclair. And we're back, everybody, here on 90.3 WMSC, Upper Montclair. You're listening to The Digital Dash with your host, Javier Reyes. That's me. That's me. That's me, guys. Um, Just got done talking with my friend Alex Vitas about Super Bowl and patriots and how awful they are and how he's a patriots fan and that makes him awful um and that was fun you know what i mean i'm looking forward to the super bowl i think it'll be pretty cool um don't know what my plans are just yet still trying to figure that out 
but I do know I will be watching it um, and rooting very, very hard for the Los Angeles Rams um, because it's it's anti-Pats, man. You got to be anti-Pats. You just got to be, um, unless you're like an actual Patriots fan. Um, so that's going to be fun. Uh, big week, obviously. We're going to hear new stories about that all week. And now I wanted to pivot to something completely different, and that's what I did within my spare time this weekend, is I played a whole lot of a video game, a very certain video game. And one of them video games, you know, I like them video games a lot. Uh, and the one I played was Spyro, uh, the Reignited Trilogy, uh, which is for the PlayStation 4 and Xbox One. Um, I think also available on Steam, if I'm not mistaken. But I have it for the PlayStation 4, and it is a collection um, of the original three Spyro games that was released back in the uh, the late 90s, I believe 1998 is when the, the first Spyro game was um, released, Spyro the Dragon, for the original PlayStation. Um, and this is a re-upped kind of remastering of those original three games. Um, and it looks great. Uh, I must say that it is very similar in the vein of last year's uh, Crash Insane trilogy, which was also launched uh, exclusively at first on the PlayStation 4, and now it's on the Switch and what have you. Um, and what's interesting is I, I remember when they first announced the Crash Insane Trilogy, or at least they announced that he was coming back, and it was an awesome, awesome announcement. It was super exciting. I was excited. But I had to admit to myself where I was like, I didn't get too lost in the hype because I'm not the biggest Crash Bandicoot fan in the world. I, I enjoy the games, um, the original PlayStation games. I enjoy the second and third games. Because I actually do believe that the first Crash Bandicoot game is just objectively not good. I do not think it is a good game. I think if you go back and play that original game, you can see a lot of faults with the mechanics and the, the control scheme is weird and it's the, the platforming can be more frustrating than it is a fair challenge. Um, they improved that in the sequels, but in the original, I definitely feel that way. Um, and I can't really speak to whether they improved some of my concerns over the first one with the, uh, the Insane Trilogy remaster because I didn't play that. But for Spyro, Spyro I wanted to play because Spyro, from what I remembered, uh, was more of a, a relaxing series that just had a, it just has such a classic vibe to it, you know what I mean? It's a platformer, and it has its fair moments of challenge, but it wasn't like frustrating challenge from what I remember. Um, I actually remember only playing when I was a kid the original Spyro the Dragon. I never played the second one, um, and I remember playing fairly, like quite extensively the third game, which is Spyro Year of the Dragon. And... Over the weekend, I was able to play just the opening bits of the first game because that's one that I kind of remembered a decent amount, so I didn't play too much into it. And also because I'm using it as uh, part of my Let's Play series that I'm hopefully going to be able to post later if you guys want to check that out, um, if you follow me on my social medias and stuff. Um, and I played a lot of the second game, um, and I played a little bit of the third. Since the third I've played so much of, and because of the first I played like about half of it when I was younger, I want to focus a lot more on the second game. And my initial impression so far is that it's really good. And what I would say about Spyro is, first of all, it's developed by Insomniac Games. Not this, the, uh, I'm sorry, the Reignited Trilogy, this thing that I'm playing right now, is not developed by Insomniac Games. Um, but the original game series is. Now, if you guys don't know, Insomniac Games, they are my favorite developer because they're the ones behind Spyro for the original PlayStation. And then my favorite series of all time, which is the Ratchet & Clank series. They're also responsible for Resistance and most notably and their biggest yet, which is the Spider-Man game for the PlayStation 4. That's what the developer's behind. Um, this one was not developed by uh, by Insomniac. It was remastered and whatnot by a developer called Toys for Bob, um, which is one of the developers that did a lot behind the Skylanders games. Um, and if that might scare you and make you think, oh, no, did they, like, Skylander it? No, they didn't. It's very much the original games. I'm happy to report that. And this came out, I know this came out back in November, but... I'm a little bit late, but I finally got around to playing it. Um, and like I said, it wasn't necessarily one of my favorite series growing up. But it was done by Insomniac, and they're otherwise known as the Kings of Happiness um, in my book. Um, and what's really, what's really the mo the thing that stands out the most is that visually it is, it is incredible. You know what I mean? It's beautiful. It's just got a really bright, resplendent kind of look to it that captures the original Spyro but in a way that it doesn't separate from the original games, it feels like a true remaster, not remaster, remake, and it doesn't take away what made those original games so beloved and great on the PlayStation. It's just an up-res, and it just everything looks better. It's just the tiny things, like when you're breathing your fire and you're on the grass, like it leaves scorch marks for a little bit, like just tiny little things like that. It really looks awesome. And 
well, the most, the th- my biggest takeaway is just that it's a classic throwback to, you know, the mascot kind of platformers of old. You know what I mean? And it used to be more widespread that it used to be about Crash Bandicoot and it used to be about Sly Cooper and Jack and Daxter and all these guys, a lot of PlayStation people. Um, and Mario and Sonic too, to to a degree, and many, many more that I haven't mentioned, where back in the day it feels like those were the big, the biggest like titles. You know what I mean? Now it's more first person shooters and a little bit more about these cinematic experiences with the advancement in technology. Mm. And sorry, I just had to take a sip of water there. Um, and it's 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 really cool. It's like a tribute to that. That's what this trilogy has meant to me. Um, playing it so far and it really it's just simple not super hard it's 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 challenging to a degree sometimes um but it's just clean fun and it takes you back to when you were a kid playing those type of mascot platforms because i think everybody has at one point whether like i said you were a crash a spyro guy a ratchet and clank guy like me uh, jack and daxter maybe conquer from the old days on nintendo 64 or banjo kazooie you know those type of characters um and it takes you back, and it's like a very simple game, and it's just that vein of it is really kind of impactful, and I really enjoyed that part of it. And it also looks beautiful to boot. Um, I wouldn't say that this is something that everyone will like, just because I think if you didn't play them when you were younger, and if you didn't play video games a lot when you were younger, um, maybe you're not looking for this type of, you know, these platformers, you know what I mean? But But what it does do is it's great, and... You know, it's not a super deep story or anything like that. None of these kind of mascot platformers really rarely are, uh, un- unless in the case of Sonic, who is the more games they did for him, the worse he got off. But um, that's that's an entire whole nest of hornets that I don't want to poke right now. Um, and what I think that is is so great is that they they capture Spyro in a way that it's just man, like just running around and collecting the gems. It feels awesome. Like they're, they're they're just so bright, and it reminds me. It's just doing that simple task of just running around, and collecting these gem things, and collecting things, has been a fun kind of gameplay experience. And because, you know, for me personally, last year I didn't play as much video games as I usually do. One because I didn't have a lot of time, and also, two, which might have been a bigger factor to it, was because I just kind of lost my same drive to play like hardcore like buying games a lot more you know what i mean i'd be playing i play this one marvel contest of champions on my phone like all the time but like real like kind of full-fledged video games i didn't do too much last year you know what i mean i did more towards the end of the year but i got i got god of war and i didn't finish it i got horizon for christmas and didn't finish that and then i got red dead redemption 2 this past like fall and didn't really finish that i got spider-man and i completely obliterated that obviously because you know i'm a big spider-man fan and that was going to be my number one thing that I definitely would finish. But, you know, I didn't play as many games last year as I thought I would. I'd still played quite a decent amount. You know what I mean? I played stuff on the Switch and, you know, Smash Bros. and that, but I used to play a lot, lot more. Maybe that's just me having too many interests and not having enough time to uh, fulfill all of them. But I definitely feel like over the like the last year that I kind of lost my touch a little bit with the gaming world. Um, and one thing that Spyro's done for me is it's kind of slowly pulled me back in. It's like the perfect game to relax and play. You know what I mean? And that's why I think I decided to use it for my Let's Play series that I'm hopefully going to post soon. And I think that's what's made it so effective in that regard, where it's just worked in that respect. And it's worked as a, a fun game that really anybody can play. Um, it's not hardcore or anything like that, but what it is is it's beautiful. It is grounded in classic platforming style and great level design and a story that just ca- carries things along, especially in the first game. There's not too much of a story. And it's a collectathon. And if you like collecting things and 100%ing things, then this is definitely one of those games that's type for you. Um, and the reason why I was looking forward to it is because I wanted that kind of nostalgic throwback to when I was sitting at home on the weekends because I didn't have friends really growing up in middle school. I-, I had some, don't get me wrong. But a lot of weekends I'd spend alone. And when it was... Uh, when it was Saturday, the first thing I did was I'd wake up super early, I'd jump out of my bed, bed and the, the TV right next to me in my room, and I just hopped on and sat on that chair and played video games all day. That's all I did, really. And it takes me back to that in a good way. And it's got this nostalgic feel to it that I think that uh, not many games always accomplish. you know. And I think that Spyro is... And like I said, it's not even one of my favorite uh, franchises that I played when I was younger. You know what I mean? I played it, certainly, but it was not my favorite. Um... And I have to admit, part of me wants to now get the older versions of these games and play those again. 
but that's like a project for another like for months ahead now but just just to like be even more nostalgic about it and go back and play it and also just for a comparison i want to see like how much more fluid the the reignited trilogy is you know what i mean it really feels much better to play versus the older spiral games which at times just because they, sh- they show their age every now and then but i still feel like there's just something about the the old aesthetic that we all miss you know what i mean everybody has you know nostalgia can be a dangerous thing every now and then where it makes us think things that we used to play or used to do or used to see or think or whatever that it was better than what it is now and oftentimes it wasn't and you're only remembering the best of what it was um but yeah that's it's just it's just a lot of fun man and i i really i'm looking forward to playing it more but unfortunately you know because reasons uh i won't be able to as much and also because kingdom hearts 3 is coming out tomorrow so i'm probably gonna invest a lot of my time in that to prepare for next week's show and a bunch of other things that i'm planning on working on um but yeah that's those are just my some of my quick thoughts on um spyro the reignited trilogy and um i also wanted to touch on really quickly just I, i've been talking about mascot platformers a lot i just wanted to mention like a lot of people they talk about missing these these games which i do to a degree but i think sometimes people make a mistake of thinking that we need these games back. And what I mean by that is that they want sequels, that people still want a Jack 4. You know what I mean? Or they want another, um, like they're dying for, uh, what's it called, Insomniac, like to do this, another um, Spyro game, like a sequel, Spyro 4, or they're trying to get um, Naughty Dog to do a sequel to the Crash games. You know what I mean? And I think this lane of remakes and these kind of like up res and remastering those games is the way to go. One, because it's financially very lucrative. These games have sold well. Both the Crash one and the Spire one sold exceptionally well. Like remaking and up everything and kind of doing it in that vein versus doing se- strictly sequels. Because I think a lot of times people say they want this, but I don't think they really do. And I think that when it comes to developers like Naughty Dog and Insomniac Games, you see why we move on. You know what I mean? You see why... It's important to not just get stuck in the past because then you move on to new stories and new properties and new and new ideas that prove to be even more interesting. Imagine if if we just had Naughty Dog creating just Ratchet, uh, I'm sorry, not Ratchet and Clank, just Crash Bandicoot and more Jack games. Like that would be clearly a waste of their potential because look what they made. You know what I mean? They made Uncharted and they made The Last of Us and these games have their place. But I do think that we shouldn't want them from those guys. We shouldn't want them to revisit this, that they've clearly shown that they can, they're capable of so much more and doing more interesting things. That's not a knock on the Crash and Spyros of the world, but it just says that, you know, do we really want Naughty Dog with what they've done? And look at, just look up The Last of Us Part Two, the demo from E3. Just look it up. You know what I mean? Do you really want that, those guys to go back and do another Crash game? Not really. And I do think that this lane of these remakes and similar, the, the way that they've done for Spyro and Crash are kind of the way to go. And I think it'd be cool to see in the future that maybe they bring back, you know, Banjo-Kazooie and Banjo-Tooie and maybe do something for the old, like the original three Ratchet games. I know they had the 2016 game, which was very much kind of a remake of the first one um, in its own way. But maybe that's the way to do it. You don't forget about these mascot, cute and cuddly platformer guys from days of old, but you don't necessarily want to sequelize them. I think that's the lesson that I would take away from Spyro and crash and what they've done and i think it's really important it's really cool it's a viable you know thing it's a viable thing to want these type of games because they're really good and they you need them you know what i mean i don't want to just play games that are always super cinematic and hyper realistic or first person shooters or simulations and whatnot you know what i mean there's a place for having the spires of the world and then going on your horse and doing whatever you want in red dead redemption 2 there's something really beautiful about that and the variety is what makes it so so good and it's why i love video games you know, so so yeah, those are my thoughts on Spyro and just just old nostalgia and all that stuff. A little bit of a not a rant, but me rambling on. Hopefully you guys enjoyed it. Uh, but yeah, that's all I have to say about that. We're going to take a little bit of a break. And when we get back, I'm talking Oscars, baby. Oh, yeah. Oh, baby. I've been waiting all week. I'm excited. I wish that Rob was here and he might be listening right now, but I, I miss him. I miss you, buddy. Uh, he probably knows how upset I am and how angered I'm going to be about what happened but here we go folks it's going to be great uh so stay tuned you're listening to 90.3 wmsc upper montclair and what is up everybody what is up everybody we are back here 
on 90.3 WMSC Upper Montclair. Now, I don't know if you could tell by the chorus that was pounding in the back of that last song that was Hey Heartbreaker by Dream Wife that you were listening to. Um, but we're back. You're on 90.3 WMC Upper Montclair. Uh, just finished talking about Spyro and, yeah, just finished talking about Spyro and, you know, how cool he is and how much fun the Ignited Trilogy has been. But now we're getting on to the real, the real main event. I really, I, I'm just, I keep thinking about how upset I am that my partner in crime, Mr. Robert O'Connor, isn't here. And I hope he's listening. I don't know if he is. But if he is, I miss you, buddy. But now it's time to talk about the Oscars. Last week, the nominations were revealed. And now, quickly before I get into my thoughts, let me just like kind of recap and uh, say what they were, if anybody missed them. I'm um, reading from Variety. Um, let's see here. Uh, the uh, <laughs> Roma and The Favorite led nominations for the 91st Oscars, scoring 10 nods each. Both films were nominated for Best Picture, alongside Black Panther, Black Klansman, Bohemian Rhapsody, A Star is Born, Vice, and Green Book. Glenn Close picked up her 7th Academy Award nod for Best Actress in The Wife, while Lady Gaga nabbed her first acting nomination for A Star is Born. Their competition includes Olivia Colman for The Favorite, Elitza Aparicio for Roma, and Melissa McCarthy for Can You Ever Forgive Me? The Best Actor race includes Christian Bale for his turn as former VP Dick Cheney in Vice, Rami Malek as iconic queen frontman Freddie Mercury in Bohemian Rhapsody, Bradley Cooper in A Star is Born, William Dafoe as Vincent Van Gogh in At Eternity's Gate, and Viggo Mortensen in Green Book. Really interesting how Variety gave a description of what the role for every actor was, except for Bradley Cooper and Viggo Mortensen. I don't know. That's just, that's just funny. Um, so yeah, they were announced really early Tuesday morning with Kumail Nanjiani and Tracy Ellis um ross they were the the presenters or the people that announced it if you guys were following that um on twitter as i was um but yeah just really quickly again best picture black panther black klansman bohemian rhapsody the favorite green book roma a star is born in vice for lead actor it's christian bale bradley cooper william defoe rami malek and vigo mortensen lead actress yalitza aparicio glenn close olivia coleman lady gaga and melissa mccarthy uh, for supporting actor, it's Mahershala Ali, Adam Driver, Sam Elliott, Richard E. Grant, Sam Rockwell. Uh, supporting actress, a Amy Adams, Marina De Tavira, Regina King, Emma Stone, and Rachel Weiss. And for director, Spike Lee, Paolo Pawlowski, uh, Yorgos Lanthimos, Alfonso Coron, and Adam McKay. Um, animated feature, uh, in Incre The Incredibles 2, Isle of Dogs, Mirai, Ralph Breaks the Internet, and Spider-Man Enter the Spider-Verse. Uh, for some other, just, I'm not, I don't want to read through every single one. You guys can all check them out yourselves, but adapted screenplay, the Ballad of Buster Scruggs, um, Black Klansman, Can You Ever Forgive Me, If Beale Street Could Talk, and A Star Is Born, and for original screenplay, The Favorite, First Reformed, Green Book, Roma, and Vice, uh, Cinematography, Cold War, The Favorite, Never Look Away, Roma, A Star Is Born, um, I'm going to just leave a lot of these out but bottom line is like i mentioned there's a lot of you know black panther got a lot of nominations including stuff for like costume design no acting awards unfortunately um and best picture of course um and bohemian rhapsody got some uh a star is born uh let's let's just get right into it one of the biggest things that happened was um a star is born not getting it, it was snubbed in a little bit in a, in a bunch of ways and all those revolve around one person, and that's Bradley Cooper. Bradley Cooper was somehow not nominated for Best Director, um, despite having been nominated for a lot of other, uh, despite having been nominated in a lot of the other award shows. And it's really shocking to me. And, and w here's the thing. I've officially decided that I think I'm rooting for A Star is Born at this year's Oscars. And the reason why is because I really think we're going to have an, oh, oh, no, like we made a mistake in about three years from now. Not because necessarily this is the best movie ever made, but I think we're going to look back and be like, that was the movie that kind of like captured the nation. I, I know nothing really captures the nation, but like that was the movie that A Star is Born that really everyone was talking about, it felt like. That along with, you know, a lot of the Marvel movies as usual and Black Panther. But I think Star is Born was also very good and it was surprising in a lot of ways. Um... So I'm rooting for it because I liked it and because I think it objectively was, like like I said, the movie that kind of captured the nation and people. And I feel like we usually don't always see that happen with what wins Best Picture. I feel like we see this fairly frequently, actually. You know, sometimes it's they get it fairly um, spot on. Um, but last year, you look at The Shape of Water. Now, I ask everybody out there, how many times do you think, how many conversations do you think you've had with people about 
The Shape of Water in the last year, aside from conversations that revolve around, hey, what won Best Picture last year? Besides those. I mean, who's really talked about that movie? I'm not saying it's a bad movie. It's good. It's a good movie. It's just not, in my opinion, Guillermo del Toro's best movie. I think his best movie is Pan's Labyrinth. But I think that that's a problem and that every year, and I think that Get Out, clearly, like how many people have you talked to over the last year about Get Out? You've probably heard someone reference it. People still talk about that movie. You know what I mean? The year before was Moonlight, which I think was the right movie to win Best Picture just based on what I thought was better. But I did think La La Land was also really good, and I thought that movie captured the people a lot. You know what I mean? I thought that a lot of people were talking about it. And yeah, I know that some of its politics, people get upset with the whole jazz thing and um, Ryan Gosling's character kind of positioned in a way that suggests that he invented jazz and people were a little bit annoyed by that. Um, So there's some political things in that. But for the most part, I thought that movie was really, really entertaining. And I thought that we should it should have been celebrated in the fact that it was a musical that somehow was able to be mainstream and because musicals aren't really as mainstream these days anymore. Um, and I thought that was really cool. You know what I mean? And it didn't win. And while I do think a, uh, Moonlight might have been the better movie, I think that, you know, once again, the movie that kind of captured everybody didn't really win. Um, and that's kind of the case as always with the Oscars. You know what I mean? That just seems to happen a lot. Um, and a lot of times I, I think it's for we're worse off for it. And I think this year um, I liked Roma. Uh, the more I think about it, I the more I like it. I thought it was exceptionally well shot, well directed, and it is a well done movie. However, this is the problem. Uh, first of all, I also it's one of those movies that I really will completely understand if someone tells me they didn't like it. You know what I mean? And I don't think that that's what I think that we should take that into account when talking about best picture. Not to say that every good movie is something that's meant for everyone, but we shouldn't dismiss popularity as a factor. You know what I mean? We shouldn't just have what wins Best Picture be whatever we're going to teach in film schools. You know what I mean? It shouldn't just be about what's the most, what's the best shot and what conveys a certain theme and what's a, in quote, human story, which is my least favorite term on the planet that pretentious people use to discuss movies. Um, but I think that I really will understand when people are like, eh, I just didn't like it that much. For me, a lot of the big parts in Roma didn't hit. A lot of the emotional scenes that I won't really talk about right now they didn't hit with me as much. That was why I didn't uh, make my personal top 10 of the year. Um, but I do think it was good at what it was trying to be, which is what I, I stress a lot, which is we need to look at movies and try to understand what they're trying to be instead of comparing the Romas to the Black Panthers and saying one is better at what it does. You know what I mean? Like a, a, a box office huge movie shouldn't be faulted because it didn't do what an artsy movie does and vice versa. Um, and I think that... And, and it's it's really awesome that Black Panther was nominated. I think that was awesome. I think that was rad. It's super cool. And I wrote about this in the Montclarian last year. If you guys want to check that out, about how I thought this was going to happen, for for a bunch of reasons that you can that you can read. But you know, I think that there is still some mistakes this year, and I think a lot of them revolve around the nomination of Bohemian Rhapsody and Green Book. Now these two movies are completely different for why I think that they're problematic. And I haven't seen both, so I want to preface that. But Bohemian Rhapsody, there's there's problems with both of them, and a lot of it has to do with behind the scenes stuff. Let's start with uh, let's start with Bohemian Rhapsody, which was a big, hugely wildly successful movie, and people really like Queen, or they just really uh want to pretend that they always liked Queen because they finally heard their music for once in a mainstream kind of way. Um, Bohemian Rhapsody, from what everyone's told me, like a lot of people have told me, um, with the exception of maybe one or two people, um that it's, it's just a bad, bad movie, and that it might be one of the worst movies to be nominated for Best Picture, which says a lot in the age of uh, Crash having won Best Picture before. It definitely says a lot. But I think that the issue here, like I said, isn't that they nominated something that was popular and that it's, you know what I mean? Like, that's cool, and I like it when movies that people actually see instead of movies like The Wife where it's not nominated for Best Picture or anything, but literally nobody has seen that movie. I don't even think you can, which is, this is my problem with the Oscars. They have this 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 attitude about them where they're like, oh, we're going to, all you people out there, you little peasants, you can all like your little superhero movies and whatnot, but we're going to tell you what the real best movies are of the year. And in fact, a lot of them you haven't even had the chance to see yet. There's just something wrong with that messaging for there to be a show about best movies of the year and for a lot of them to be things that people... Not that they didn't see it, that too, but also that they didn't even get a chance to see it. 
And this happened with The Post last year, which I always bring up as a movie that I protest and I will not ever, I don't think I'm ever going to see because you can't release a movie with that big of a cast and people behind it with Streep and, and Spielberg and Tom Hanks and release it like December 29th at 11.58 p.m. and to like three critics. And then that counts as it being a movie for this year. And then everyone actually gets to see it in January. It's like, wh- that's just weird to me. You know what I mean? Like make it then make it that it should be eligible for this year's Oscars. You know what I mean? But of course, you know, God forbid that the Academy actually watches anything past three months ago, which is another one of my takeaways is that clearly the Academy every year only watches movies that came out in the last three months. That's just what happens. I know Black Panther and Get Out last year, another example, but it just seems like and I'm not blaming studios for it and I'm not blaming strict always strictly the Academy. It's it's a two way street where they both complement each other where it's studios put things out at the end of the year because they want to be nominated and then the people who are voting they remember the things put out at the end of the year so it's it's hard to say but um what was i saying and with bohemian rhapsody where it's a popular movie it's a big movie but it's one just not good from what i've been told and secondly in the age of hollywood trying to say we're trying to learn and we're trying to move past things and we're trying to say this is the new age and things are going to be different for you to nominate a movie that has brian singer behind it who uh, just look him up, Google him, and look up his personal life and what he's been accused of doing uh, because you're going to be disgusted. And the fact that a movie, I know he left like production like halfway through, but the fact that you want to kind of celebrate a movie like that, especially a movie that um, a wide array of people have said is just not good, um, is very questionable to me. And I think that it shows that the Academy still isn't learning. And it makes me wonder, like, why didn't you just put like Avengers Infinity War in there? Were you trying to go for a popular thing? Because if you want to go for a popular thing, how about we do the movie that was popular? Oh, I'm sorry, not just popular. One of the most popular movies of all time versus and also objectively by most people and critics included said was good. People enjoyed Infinity War versus the movie that a lot of people think is really bad and was pretty popular, too. It made about seven hundred, eight hundred million dollars. It was a big success this year for sure. Like, I don't see why someone can't convince me that we can replace Infinity War or replace um, Bohemian Rhapsody with Infinity War. That's what I would personally do. And I liked some a lot of other movies more than Infinity War. I'm just saying if from the popular perspective. Then there's the question of Green Book, which is a movie that a lot of people have told me is some people have told me is utter trash, but I kind of don't believe them because they saw it after all the controversy came out. So I feel like people are trying to talk themselves into being how bad it is. The people that I trust say that the movie is actually kind of good if you take away what's wrong with it. Now, what I mean by that is the baggage behind it and the fact that the people behind it may not have actually consulted the per- the black character in the movie um, in real life, like his family. They didn't consult him. There's a lot of baggage that I can't really unpack entirely right now, but that's kind of a problem. You know what I mean? The fact that you're going to – and especially for screenplay and writing – for you to nominate something that the family says is just not accurate or fully accurate is problematic. And there's this, apparently there's this chicken wing scene in the movie that's has a lot of problems with it um, and is kind of racist. <laughs> um, for those, if you know what I'm talking about, you probably understand what I mean. And that's problematic. It's And what's interesting is it sounds like it's a movie that is good. It's a good, like kind of well-made movie and you can see why people like it. So it's not some one of those things where people who like it are racist or what have you. It's just that they probably don't realize everything. You know what I mean? It's one of those. In, in a similar vein of Crash, where I think people didn't realize until after like why that movie was problematic. Um, but yeah, I think that it's it just shows like man, like what are they doing? Like nominate Spider Verse, nominate Eighth Grade. By the way, one of the big snubs of this year. I've heard First Reformed is quite good, although it's for a very particular taste palette from what I hear. But, like, eighth grade, my favorite movie of last year, that gets nothing, no original screenplay thing, but Green Book's going to be in there. You know what I mean? Like, eighth grade was phenomenal, and it's like nothing's going to be in there for that. And now people are approaching the door. Do they want to be let in? I don't know if they want to be let in. I'm going to assume no. I'm just going to assume no. Hopefully. Let me just check here. No? Yep. Yep. No. Okay, they're good. They're just taunting me. Anyway, um, but that's, that's like, kind of my – my thought on that and i think it's it's just weird man like why are we doing this every year we have these weird mistakes like i mean come on like just 
what are we doing now? And it's it's kind of crazy too because I always talk about having more of a populist Oscars like Black Panther. A lot of people saw that. A lot of people saw Bohemian Rhapsody. Um, a good amount of people saw Roma. You know what I mean? Because that was on Netflix and people can easily access that, and millions of people have Netflix. Um, and A Star Is Born. You know what I mean? Another one. And Vice did pretty well too. So in that respect, I think the Academy did well by having like a nice little mixture of both the art house independent movies and the movies that people actually watch, for lack of a better term. Um, and another thing is, but I think that they messed up with Bradley Cooper. You know what I mean? This isn't the worst Oscars nominations ever. I think there have been years where it was far worse. But it's just puzzling to me that, that I mean, A Star is Born is a movie I'm rooting for because that movie does so much. It appeals to all kinds of people. It appeals in a way that the first hour, and I know people complain about the latter act of it, although I think people are talking themselves into disliking Star is Born in, in some respects. And that I think, just look at the, like, I look at, like, just the peripherals almost of that movie. It's first-time director Bradley Cooper. Um, he's also acting in the movie. And he's using an accent. And he's talking that weird, like, this the whole time. And he's learning to play, play guitar. And he's learning to sing. And it also has Lady Gaga, who is exceptional in the movie. And it's also a remake of a movie that's been done, like, three or four times. And it's good. You know what I mean? Like, there's so many things that tell me... This is, I really feel like, guys, I really feel like in four, like, I'm honestly, next year, we're going to be like, oh, no, like, why didn't the Star is Born win? That was the movie that satisfied on almost every level, in my opinion. Being good, having a good story to it, um, being a movie that a lot of people liked and saw, and it was just kind of a topic of conversation. Maybe it's that it came out a little bit early. I came out in October. Maybe it needs to come out in November, because, like I said, God forbid the Academy actually watches things that came out this year. Um but I think that it's really unfortunate in that respect. He got really robbed. You know what I mean? I really think Bradley Cooper got robbed. And this might be maybe, what if this is the only good movie he ever makes again? And the fact that he'll never get, he never got his nomination even for A Star is Born, I think is just absolutely ridiculous. And I say it all the time. I think the Oscars are full of a bunch of people who, in a way, are hacks and that they really don't actually pay attention to. They don't have the pulse of what people are actually talking about when it comes to movies. I think they know certain things, but I think they're they're really stuck up, and I think they're snobs. And I snobs are some of the things that I hate the most in life, and that, that's what really you know annoys me the most is that I think that you know I don't think this was as bad as years have passed, but I think it is still problematic in a lot of ways. And I think the Green Book and Bohemian Rhapsody thing are really kind of the capstone to that, and show that they're not really paying attention. You know what I mean? you would think that the controversy behind this movie would kind of kill it. Now, I saw, I'm not going to take credit to this, would we only care about Brian Singer if he had some old tweets? Because apparently that's all that people care about. It's either seeing video evidence in the case of like football players where they get in trouble only if there's a video versus what's written, or it's in the case of Brian Singer and the Hollywood people where it's like, oh no, only if they had old offensive tweets. You know what I mean? That's the only way to bring things down these days. You know what I mean? You guys can read more into the Brian Singer thing. It really is... Uh, like awful like what's what he's been accused of of course not that it's he's you know guilty officially of course but he has been accused of a whole lot of things and it's just it's perplexing to see that the academy is just kind of yeah whatever we're okay with this you know what i mean and it happens every year and i just don't understand that like like it, we just do this every year man I've, I've been saying that ad nauseum man and i'm sorry it's great to see black panther in there um, I know Bill Maher is super happy about that. Shout out Bill Maher, uh, a known idiot, as I've said on um, the show before. Um, I'm saying that because he's he's the epitome of snobbery, and he's he's kind of he's he's a hack too in his own way. He's he's really funny. He's a very funny guy, but he's also I'm just really annoyed at his his descent towards the comic book genre and acting like people who read these stories and narratives are just children, um, which is just unequivocally just not true. You know what I mean? Just just stop. Just stop talking. You know what I mean? Every every great art that comes out, not every great art, but a lot of great novels and literature in the course of history have probably, at one point when it came out, people probably thought it was low brow or they pro thought it was no good. You know what I mean? And whatnot. So just just stop. You know what I mean? Just stop talking, Bill Maher. But yeah, it is it is really cool to see like Black Panther in there. The problem is that I kind of expected it um, and that it wasn't super surprising just based off of my own uh, reasoning and reasoning of others that it was expected but still it is cool um it wasn't my favorite movie last year either but i do think it would be cool to see it win but i don't think it will there's just no way that a first time comic book movie gets that gets that win although it would make a lot of people happy but still um it's great 
Um, and it's great to see it in there. And it's definitely a step forward of them finally being like, oh, wow, maybe we should nominate. Maybe we should pay attention to that little genre over there, that that those comic book movies that are, one, good, and two, making a lot of money and dominate everything. You know what I mean? The Oscars, a lot of times, I feel like they have a bunch of people who are stuck in a bubble and they're just kind of awarding themselves. You know what I mean? They're like talking to themselves. And you never want to be talking to yourself. Surround yourself with people with different tastes and different beliefs than you. You know what I mean? What's up, Josh? Yeah, yeah, what's up? You, you better walk away. Hey, Adam. You too. <laughs> um, But yeah, guys, um, that about does it for the show today. Um, Like I said, I wish I could have talked to Rob about the Oscars, but we will be talking about them soon. Um, uh, later in the semester or maybe in the next couple weeks we'll be talking about them more um, in a different more creative way and I'm really looking forward to that uh, it's going to be a lot of fun and I'm not going to share what it is exactly what we got cooked up but I know he's excited for it I know I'm excited for it so yeah um, ladies and gentlemen that about does it for today's edition of the Digital Dash remember that you can always tune into the show every Monday from now no longer 4pm to 7pm but 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. here on 90.3 WMSC Upper Montclair or the iHeartRadio app. And as always, to close things out, it's going to be Journey with Separate Ways, Worlds Apart. Remember, everyone, never accept the world for what it appears to be. Dare to see it for what it could be. I'm Javier Reyes, and I hope you all have a terrific day. See you next time.